week. Hence, it hasn't been a coup. Um, I'm not the uh, chairman, other than in a temporary capacity for today. Um, so, hi to Ian, who's watching at home, uh, and also to my mum and dad, of course. Um, and uh, I'd just like to remind both witnesses and colleagues, we have a lot to get through today. So, brevity in questions as well and answers. Welcome, Ruth. And um, just register of interest, I was a minister for a short period of time, so I do know the three witnesses. I don't think anybody else probably has anything to declare at this point. In which case, Secretary of State, I believe you'd like to make an opening statement yeah. of no more than two minutes. Chairman, yeah, um, thank you very much. Well, um, great pleasure to be here. Of course, uh, disappointed um, that the uh, Chairman of the Committee is not able to be with us, but a great pleasure to have you in the Chair. Um, I, I thought it would be helpful to the Committee just to give a brief update about where we are with uh, industrial action on the railways, and of course I'd be happy to take any questions uh, afterwards. Um, uh, as you know, I I'm said publicly I'm very disappointed that the RMT have turned down um, the offer uh, that they've been made. Uh, it was an improved offer. I met with uh, trade unions. I thought that dialogue was helpful. Uh, it's not my role to negotiate uh, in place of the employers and the trade unions, but I said that I and the Rail Minister would work to try and facilitate an offer. Um, and I think it's not just a pay dispute, it's about reform of the rail industry. And in the context of the fact that we've put the taxpayers have put £31 billion of support into the rail industry over the past two years, obviously driven by COVID and the, the fact that a significant number of passengers have not returned to the railways. That's equivalent to over £1,000 per household in the country and over £300,000 per rail worker. That is the context about why we need reform. It means that we protected uh, the railway jobs uh, it also meant staff at DFT contracted railway companies were not furloughed, uh, did not lose any pay during that period. And we've, we've only seen about 80% of passenger numbers return to the railways. So I think we've got to have reform. I want a thriving, successful railway. That's the only way you protect those jobs in the long term. Um, my department spends something uh, over 60% of the department's total spending on capital and revenue on railways and only 10% of journey miles in the country are on rail. Uh, and I just think we have to get that into a better sense of balance. So that's what we're trying to do with the, with the unions. Uh, I would still urge the unions to um, keep talking, um, put those deals to their members, uh, um, with at least a neutral recommendation, and call off the strikes before Christmas, which are going to be so damaging to individuals and businesses across a whole range of sectors. And the government will do what we can to try and encourage both employers and unions to keep talking. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, and Secretary, obviously we you. can take some, some questions on that. And of um, course, any other questions the committee wishes we, to, to ask. We, we have a schedule. And actually, for anybody watching, I think maybe in, in about 20 minutes' time, I think we, we might be hitting on to that particular issue. But thank you very much for that scene setting. And actually, leading on to that, my opening question to you is, um, when we reach the end of this parliament, presumably around this time in 2024, and obviously we're assuming that you will still be in the role, I hope you will be, uh, what will success look like for you? Well, I think if I step through the, the, the various areas, the, the most obvious one, and coming back to what, where I started, um, is getting the railway system, I think, on a sustainable position. Um, it's been, there's been a massive impact from COVID in terms of the changed uh, patterns of behaviour, the fact that commuter traffic is still only around 60% of what it was pre-pandemic and I think because of what people are now able to do with technology and the change working patterns I suspect that isn't going to come back we've seen an increase in leisure travel so I think the railways need to uh, be more flexible we need a proper seven-day railway uh, where we don't depend on people coming to work voluntarily uh, and we need a sustainable long-term position for rail so I think that that would probably be the, the first thing I would say. Um, but I'm also very conscious that the vast majority of journeys that people take are, are either on roads um, or they're active travel, they're walking or cycling <coughs> um, or they're using buses uh, locally. So I think it's also making sure that as well as the inevitable conversations we have about rail, which are driven by the current position, the impact of the pandemic and what the department spends its money on, I'm very conscious we need to make sure we continue investing in roads, we have to obviously play our part in uh, delivering our net zero ambitions in decarbonising transport across all of the, the modes. 
uh, and ensuring we continue investing in roads, we continue investing in buses, um, and we make sure that we enable people to get around. I suppose the final thing is the government is very clear that we need to grow the economy, we need to improve economic growth, and I think the autumn statement and the fact that the Chancellor maintained our budgets, both capital and revenue, the government sees investment in transport as a way of driving growth in the economy. So I think, I think all of those things um, is how I would measure uh, whether we're successful. Thank you for the clarity there. Um, obviously, you were appointed actually on my birthday, 25th of October, so um, around about six weeks in the job. Um, just some brief answers, really, so there's no need for explanation, but what are your top three immediate priorities in the role after your first six weeks? So I think the first thing that's sort of been thrust into place, again, and we'll, I won't go into it in detail because we'll, we'll come back to it, is obviously dealing with the situation on the railways, partly industrial action, and then connected to that, partly the, uh, the lack of proper service delivery on some, some routes that people well know on Avanti West Coast, on TPE. So those are issues which are raised with me both by colleagues um, and members of the public raise them as well and you get asked about them on, perfectly understandably when I met with Northern Mayors as well. Um, so that's been one. The second one, of course, I've referred to the autumn statement uh, and whilst the, it was very welcome that we had our budgets confirmed, as with every department, we're obviously having to manage the impact of inflation uh, and so we're working through the settlement that we got in the autumn statement and how we're going to continue delivering our priorities and that work is underway in the department and I'm spending a, a considerable amount of time on that. Um, and then, and that really is driving our, our uh, other priorities. So, and then I suppose the third one as a new Secretary of State is getting my head around the breadth uh, of the department, meeting all of the, the key members of staff, working with uh, Bernadette and Gareth and their teams, um, and kind of getting my head around the breadth of the department. I suppose those are my three things that I've been focused on since I was appointed. Super. Pleased to hear it, and I do hope you'll visit the other offices around the country of the department. Um, I enjoyed doing so in the summer. Um, maybe a question for your two permanent secretaries, um, but you might want to jump in, I don't know. But ministerial portfolios in the department have been significantly reshuffled twice in the last three months. What effect is this on the continuity, continuity of policy direction? And is there work in the department is behind as, um, on schedule as a result of that? Well, look, it, it, it's clear that it's not been ideal that there's been so much um, you know, change in, in ministers uh, and portfolios. I mean, I think that's kind of goes without saying a bit. Uh, but I think actually I'm very fortunate. Uh, I think we've got a very strong uh, ministerial team. Of course, this committee will be very familiar with uh, the Rail Minister, your former chair. Uh, and I've also got um, a very good ministerial team. Um, Baroness Veer remained as the sort of institutional memory or the continuity. But I think we've got a very strong team um, across the board. I've altered the portfolios and, and settled them, I think, to match people's skills. Um, and I think, of course, the blessing of a, of a very strong department at official level and the way our system works is, of course, even with change in the ministerial team, there's a, been a lot of continuity in, obviously, the work that officials have been carrying forward. And so, actually, as when I've taken on previous ministerial roles, you come into the department, you know, you're brought up to speed very quickly, but actually a lot of work goes on. Um, and actually, the department's been very good, I think, at identifying key decisions that needed to be taken, getting them in front of ministers. Uh, and I think we've, we've managed to keep things going um, quite well. I don't know, where, Bernadette, whether you want uh, to add I, anything. I would strongly, strongly agree with that. I mean, inevitably, when we've had a you know, fairly extended period of uncertainty, really, since the um, start of the leadership election in the summer and then a, a changes of ministers, um, that causes some sort of, um, you know, there are some decisions that absolutely need to be put in front of ministers and that ministers need to be confident that they fully understand before they can take them. So, you know, there are some areas where we just uh, need to recognise that changes in ministers will mean that we have to, we have to take that time and rightly allow um, new ministers uh, with new portfolios to be comfortable with decision making. But we are a department, we are very focused on delivery through our arm's length bodies, we are very kind of operational in terms of dealing with disruption to the transport network. Those sorts of activities um, continue to, mm -hmm. to, to proceed and I think we are able to get on and uh, 
do that delivery and are obviously we've always made sure that when we've had a new Secretary of State and Ministerial team we get, as you say, we prioritise the key decisions, get them in front of Ministers at the earliest possible date and keep cracking on and I think we've been able to strike, uh, strike a good balance there. Without like Dame Kelly, I don't want to call you Dame Kelly or Bernadette, really. But, um, <laughs> that's um, fine. Gareth, uh, Mr. Davis, you have anything to add to that, or shall I ask my next? Just to emphasise, I think the what we do have is obviously the continuity of the civil service teams and structures behind that. So what that means is you're able to keep the, the institutional knowledge and expertise focused on areas, as Bernadette says, on you know, say delivery of HS2 through to the transport decarbonisation plan or managing some of the operational issues we face at the start of summer. So that's being able to keep the sort of continuity as we brought new ministers up to speed and made sure they have the opportunity to shape and direct the department. Thank you. Final question from me for now. Um, departmental responses to a number of consultations across a variety of policy areas are outstanding. Mm -hmm. So is there a lack of capacity to see these pieces of work through or are they imminently about to be released before Christmas or immediately in the new year? Um, I'm not sure. Well, look, just on, on the reports that, that are outstanding, I know on the report that uh, the committee did on the integrated rail plan, uh, we wrote and secured an extension to report uh, to respond fully to next March, but we did commit to providing an update by the end of the year, uh, and we plan to do so. On the report that the committee did on road pricing, that's um, going to be responded to by the Treasury, um, and, and they're going to reply in due course. I don't have a specific time it's um, eminent correspondence to the Treasury and the uh, indeed and the Chancellor so thank you for that um, Ben I, one of the one of the uh, responses we're still waiting for is the one on pavement parking which closed two years ago uh, when, when, when might we see that yes um, I, I, I think a letter came to the committee to set out that we were considering that and looking at taking that forward um, one of the things we're looking at is our um, uh, legislative priorities so that's not something that's been forgotten I'm very well aware of it I had it raised with me in fact when I was a, a, a backbencher as a constituency member of Parliament so it, it hasn't been forgotten I just don't have a specific date to come back to the committee uh, your predecessor who wasn't there for very long but in that period did have time to come and see us uh, dropped the bombshell that the government was dropping the transport bill but she did she was very clear that she thought there'd be a narrow small transport bill is that still the case in this session? Is that your uh, expectation? I think, I think my predecessor said that, that there wasn't going to be a transport bill in this session. Um, there are clearly things which the department, uh, and, and obviously I'll, we'll go back and look at exactly what she said, but I think that's she what did. She, she said she'd be bringing forward a narrow transport confirmed. bill during this session. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I, I checked what I what she said, and I thought she said we'll check and clarify it, but I think she confirmed to the committee that there wouldn't be a transport bill this session, but we'll go back and have a look and confirm. Um, the, the, the department does obviously have some legislative um, priorities for the fourth session, and obviously we'll be making our, well, setting out our uh, plans for that, but obviously that depends on parliamentary time being available, and that decisions are obviously taken across government when you look at the but government's secretary, priorities. On, on so many of the issues that are in your department's responsibility, from uh, pavement parking, which causes misery for millions of our constituents, to the fact that we are years behind as a country in regulating e-scooters, all of these things that are holding us back, reg legislation and regulation on self-driving vehicles, we're also falling years behind our economic competitors because your department has failed to do this stuff. So when are you going to do it? Well, I, I made it very clear, Mr Bradshaw, we do have a number of things where we require legislation, but you know, as a very experienced parliamentarian who's also served in government, that decisions about the legislative programme for the full session are not, are not entirely for me. I, I will set out within government what I um, think are priorities for the department, and then the government as a whole will conclude about its priorities. Um, and that will be set out uh, in due course. But that isn't entirely a matter for me, much as I wish it were. Um, but the department's clear about the things that we wish to prioritise, and the committee will have discussed that with my predecessor and, and her predecessor. Um, but I, I, it's, not, it's not within my gift to set out the legislative priorities for the full session. But we're very clear all of the things that you said are things that I want to achieve, um, and we'll be making that case very strongly within government. What is it that's preventing the government as a whole uh, legislating on these very important matters, meaning that we are being left behind as a country? 
Well, I, I think it, it, over the last couple of years, it's fairly obviously the legislative timetable for the, for the entire parliamentary term um, has been rather transformed by, by events. I mean, COVID clearly had a massive impact on the government's entire programme. Um, and obviously there are other things going on in the world which have, have meant that the government's had the to take It's the turmoil inside steps. government itself and the constant chopping and changing of prime ministers and ministers, the inabil inability to agree on a policy and then stick to it. You don't think that's got anything to do with it? No, certain things, certain things that you've mentioned there I don't think are things that have changed at all, but there have been changes priorities. Let me just pick up one, for example. The government spent a lot of time over the since the beginning of the year. We've had the... Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine, that's necessitated a very significant amount of government funding, uh, over £100 billion being spent on supporting energy prices, and a significant amount of government effort looking at supporting individuals. And there have been a lot of changes across government to deal with that, that transformation in the economy, and a lot of time taken up by ministers and in Parliament dealing with the consequences of that effect. That's not something that could have been predicted. Um, and are events you, have impacted on what the government's focused are, its time are on. Are you prepared to commit to addressing these, just those, those three issues? They're not huge issues, but they're issues that are of massive concern to our constituents that we've been waiting for years on. Pavement parking, e-scooters and self-drive vehicles. Will this be done before the next election? Well, I'm very clear that those are priorities um, for my department, but you're a very experienced parliamentarian and you know that I do not have the ability to... Uh, promise specific legislation in the full session, I will make my case inside government. There are competing priorities for the government and decisions will be taken collectively about our legislative priorities. But those things that you've mentioned uh, are important priorities for me and I will be making that case very strongly. Do you not see that it, it leaves the impression that the government as a whole, not you, because you, you, you fight for transport's interest, but the government as a whole really couldn't care less about transport in this country. No, I strongly disagree. I think it's very clear when you look at what... Uh, if, if you judge people by putting their money where their mouth is, as uh, people often do, I think it's very clear from the autumn statement and the fact that the Chancellor didn't do what some governments in the distant past have done, which is to raid capital spending to get out of financial... Um, to, to plug gaps. Actually, we had our capital budget confirmed, and indeed capital budgets were confirmed across government, uh, and our revenue budget was confirmed. So actually, I think the government's investing in transport very strongly. We've confirmed our uh, investment in some very significant transport projects to grow the economy and to get the economy functioning better. Um, so actually, I'd say the government was investing in transport and putting transport very highly. As far as legislation is concerned, there are competing priorities. There are lots of things that are important to our constituents across a range of factors. And the government has to weigh those up. I will be making the case very strongly for transport, but as you know, those decisions are taken collectively across government, and I want to get off on the right foot with the committee. I don't want to promise the committee things that I'm not able to deliver. Things that are entirely within my control, I can promise. I can promise to go and argue for things inside government, but I can't commit at this stage for full-term legislative time for a transport bill. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Ben. Um, just because Ben has asked obviously some very searching questions, could we seek some clarification from you and your two colleagues maybe with some written um, statement maybe that we could have that will give some clarification. I understand that it's very difficult for you in the department to say when legislation might well be coming forward, but that might just be helpful for all of us. And before I know that Ruth's going to ask some questions. Yes, of course. Point, yes, okay? absolutely. And I'll set out. I'll set out perhaps for the committee uh, the legislation that we've currently got um, underway. There is some primary legislation which people may ask about um, uh, and other things that the department is working on. For example, we're, we're going to have to spend a fair bit of time on retained EU legislation to meet the requirements mm, that are set that. out in primary legislation. So if we set out perhaps what the department's currently working on uh, and we can set out some of the things that will need legislation in the future, if that will be helpful to the committee. It will be. Thank you. Ruth. I know. Well, well, thank you. Secretary of State, you, you say that there's there's pressure on the legislative timetable and there are budgets <coughs> issues, but many of the issues we're waiting for to see <coughs> legislation for um, uh, don't involve a lot of uh, spend by the department. And the legislative timetable is hardly under pressure. We've got a longer than normal uh, recess uh, this Christmas. Yeah. Uh, and there's an awful lot of days when we're not voting Absolutely. on bills. So, I, you know, I, we do think there is more to this. But 
um, the Road Safety Investigation Branch, hardly, uh, hardly controversial, uh, doesn't, won't cost a lot of money, very popular. Uh, will you bring that forward? Uh, we're hearing in our self-driving vehicles inquiry that the UK industry is losing out because of the delay in legislation here. So that's, got, that's good for, for UK business. That needs to come through quickly. Um, so, uh, um, you say there's a lot of work to do, and certainly there is a lot of work that you will have to do to review the huge amount of uh, EU retained law, as you said, but will the UK regulations be updated to world leading standards, or are we going to go with a re-smog bonfire of, of, of regulations and bonfire of red tape uh, in our attitude to, um, road, uh, to vehicle safety, which is so important to so many? Well, there's a, there's a couple of things there. J just on your first point about, about parliamentary time, you're absolutely right, of course, that um, Parliament doesn't spend all of its time voting on legislation, but, but actually, in, in the same way we're doing now, I mean, actually, part of what Parliament does, of course, is to... Uh, there is time made available for opposition day debates, um, backbench debates. I mean, it's, it's not right that the government consumes the whole of the parliamentary timetable. There are some ty the legislative <coughs> or time in Parliament is made available for non-legislative purposes, so the government doesn't have the whole timetable to itself. Uh, but I've made it clear in answer to Mr Bradshaw's question that there are some priorities for uh, my department. Uh, and you're right, some of them don't involve a huge amount of spending, but they do require legislative time to get through Parliament, and I will be making that case um, very strongly. On um, your point about regulation, I think one of the things I'm very mindful of and one of the arguments I think that all ministers are mindful of, if we can adopt regulation which uh, puts Britain in a leading position uh, and sets out a clear framework, it's clearly then of Britain becomes a very attractive country for getting uh, investment both from British companies but also from overseas investors and, and that's where I want to get the country. We've seen some examples of that already, um, but I want to get to a position on these issues, uh, as Mr Bradshaw set out, where we can actually be leading on these matters um, and be an attractive inward investment location uh, around the world, where we can see these exciting global um, steps forward taking place in Britain. That's my ambition. I think it's uh, the government's ambition, actually, because we want to drive economic growth. So one of the arguments I will be making strongly with colleagues is to exactly legislate to get that framework and put Britain right at the front of these important challenges. Okay, and uh, on t in terms of self-driving vehicles, what discussions are you having with UK firms uh, who are developing this technology about the impact of the delay on them? So I, I specifically haven't had any conversations at this point. Um, perhaps if I can ask um, Gareth yeah. to set out what the department's been doing, uh, that may be helpful. Sure. Thank you, Secretary of State. So we and my team have been working closely with the industry um, to understand the regulatory needs and particularly working with the Law Commission. We published a review over the summer of the need for, to understand particularly things, things like you know, insurance, the nature, the standardised definitions of autonomy, because there's still changes in the industry. I saw Wave recently and their chief exec to understand exactly the level of where the technology is. And it's, I, must admit, I don't know if you had the opportunity to go out in some of their vehicles, but it's pretty impressive what they've been able to achieve. And I think the progress is faster than a lot of people would have expected even a few years ago. They were able to set out very clearly what's been helpful about the UK environment. This is the, it's an awful phrase, but the regulatory sandboxes we've created, the future of mobility zones. Um, some of the R&D investments that the department has been able to support developments and expand out to companies like Zero Avia as well um, on, in aerospace. But they're also very clear about the standardization and clarification are needed really to build out the industry. So I think we couldn't be clearer in the department, <coughs> certainly within my team, the needs of the industry We'd like to think we've been leading the debate, especially with the Law Commission, which I think has done incredible work over the summer. But we know, obviously, that now needs legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Secretary of State, just listening to some of your answers um, a short while ago, I think the car manufacturing industry would um, like to see the country leading when it comes to legislation, certainly for the period 2030-35. 
because I think their view is that we're actually lagging behind at this point, the EU and the rest of the world, rather than leading from the front. But that maybe comes in the clarification about what legislation might be coming forward, if that's okay. And also, I'm particularly going to draw your attention to the fact that your predecessor and what she said when she was in front of this committee and what you've referred to. I think that we are right, and unfortunately, I think your department is wrong. But we'll leave that for another day. Is that okay? <coughs> so, moving on to Great British Railways. Uh, Chris. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you uh, again, Bernadette, and uh, Gareth particularly. Um, Secretary of State, is it still your, uh, your plan to fully implement the plan for rail, i.e. Great British Railways? So, uh, it's very much my plan to um, achieve what <coughs> the intention behind that idea, which is to get the railways um, to have, a, to have a, a guiding mind behind them, to, to have a more um, integrated position between... Um, how the different parts of the industry work. Um, what I wanted to do was take some time, as you know, there are different views about how exactly we achieve that, um, uh, not just uh, outside Parliament, but also inside Parliament. So I wanted to take some time, not too much time, but I wanted to take some time to listen to those alternative views from some of those that have uh, held the rail brief in the past uh, and others. So I've, I've started that work. I've... Um, uh, spoken to Mr. Williams, uh, I've spoken to a number of colleagues who've got views on this matter, um, and I will, uh, and talking to my colleague, the Rail Minister, uh, and we'll reach some conclusions. So uh, I haven't done yet, um, but I wanted to take some time to what, make sure we make the right decisions. So what we're saying then is that the Great British Railways proposal, as it stands, currently <coughs> is up in the air. Well, I'm taking some time to just reflect on it. Um, and to make sure when we move forward that I'm entirely happy with what we're doing. And I know there are a range of views in Parliament, yeah. and I think it's important that I take some time to listen um, uh, and bear those in mind before I make any final decisions. And given what we've just heard from you a little bit earlier about the ability to progress primary legislation, um, uh, it feels as though that certainly in this session it's going to be impossible to fully implement GBR uh, as has been set out even though at our last session um, it was made clear to us that the legislation required f to fully implement GBR would be relatively short and not complicated. Even <coughs> that I think we are clear that legislative ability for primary legislation is not going to be possible in this session. Um, what, are the, what are actually the options available uh, and what realistically are you considering on changing? Well, I've, I've obviously said in answer to Mr Bradshaw's question that we'll look at, um, at legislation for the, the fourth session, but there are, of course, things that we can do um, without legislation which we are um, continuing to work on. So we've made some commitments about rolling out contactless pay-as-you-go um, ticketing to more stations in the southeast. That work is underway. We've already got the uh, GBR transition team working. So, so we've already got some of the... Can I just come back to you? Of on course. That? My understanding is that contactless travel uh, and ticketing was contracted some time ago, and that was a, that's totally separate to this. Um, that there are, I understand, many hundreds of people working on GBR as it stands today at the taxpayers' expense. Um, we're in this situation where clearly decisions need to be made very quickly, um, and I wonder whether you could just share with us when you're likely to make that very clear decision. To, to, as to what extent GBR will, will be implemented? Well, we've already brought um, the, the transition team together, so all, it's already the case <laughs> that we've got uh, network rail and DFT teams working more closely together to look at how you align uh, the business planning between uh, track and train, which is one of the um, things that we need to do. So there's already a lot of bringing people together, working together, uh, underway already, and I'll ask the uh, Permanent Secretary to say a little bit more about that in, in a minute. There are things that you do need legislation for, um, uh, and we'll be making that case. As I said, uh, same answer, I'm afraid, as the one I gave Mr Bradshaw, which is I can't commit to doing that. But clearly there is work that can be done ahead of legislation, and of course a lot of planning can take place. And I'm on, on your final point before I ask the Permanent Secretary to, to comment. Um, in terms of making decision, I, I aim to do that at pace. But I do also just want to say, and given what I said in my opening remarks about the um, amount of resource that the department spends on rail, 
uh, and the importance of rail, I want to make sure that we make the right decisions. And I think, given I've only been in this role a, a few weeks, I just want to take the time to get it right um, before we move ahead with it. Um, Bernadette, did you just want to say a bit about the the work that's underway? Absolutely. So um, uh, we had this discussion, of course, Mr. Loder, at, at the last hearing as well, uh, and it, I think I did confirm then that legislation would be relatively um, short um, uh, as and when it's uh, brought forward. And as we discussed then, there are some things which you require legislation in order to change fundamentally, including who is the formal franchising authority. However, as the Secretary of State has indicated, uh, a great deal of the sort of purpose and sort of intent of uh, rail reform set out uh, in the white paper can be taken forward without legislation. Um, steps to um, improve and roll out, extend flexible ticketing, steps to um, drive workforce reform, other measures uh, to, to just ensure that the railway is operating more effectively and efficiently in the interests of taxpayers and passengers. There are many things that don't require legislation, and colleagues in my department, in Network Rail, etc., and in the industry are working together to drive those improvements as far and as uh, effectively as we can, uh, with or without legislation. So that work does, does indeed continue. Thank you. My, my understanding is the only thing that's really required in legislative terms is the franchising authority change. Yeah, which I, which I referred that, to. That's correct. So um, given that this process started, if I recall correctly, back in 2017, under the then Secretary of State, the member for Epsom and Yule, um, we are some five years down the line. Um, given we have many hundreds of people working on this at considerable expense, do you have a timeline to which you are working uh, for certain milestones to be delivered, even if it's not the full suite of the, the uh, original proposal? Yes, there are still plans within the department for taking forward the various work streams that I've described that don't require legislation. And obviously, we will work with the Secretary of State uh, and under his direction uh, to uh, ensure those are taken forward in a way that he is satisfied is, is, is right. Yeah, thank you. Um, the Rail Network in, uh, Enhancements Plan, the RNEP, uh, could you tell us when we're going to see that, please? Yes, yeah, so uh, as I said in, in my answer uh, earlier, one of the things that we're now doing in the department, and we're doing this uh, at some considerable uh, effort and pace, is to work through uh, both our capital and our revenue plans following the autumn statement. So one of the things uh, I'm doing with my ministerial team is looking at how we manage the as I said, we had our capital and our revenue budgets confirmed, but obviously we are having to deal with, uh, as all government departments are, and indeed the private sector, the inflation pressures. So we're looking at our capital investments uh, and looking at the priorities on those, um, and we will set out, I, I know that some of these things haven't been published for some time, we will set all of those out when we've reached conclusions uh, on our capital and our revenue priorities. Are you coming under priorities. particular pressure from the Treasury to, to find savings? No, well, as I said, our budgets were confirmed in cash terms, but of course there are significant inflation priorities that we have to manage, and we're working through those priorities now um, with my ministerial team um, across all of the areas of capital expenditure and all the areas of revenue. As I said, the information in terms of our total expenditure was set out at the autumn statement, and those, those numbers are as they were set out in the spending review, but there are some priorities that we need to, to adjust. So at this moment in time, you're not able to indicate when we'll see the RNEP coming forward or confirmed? No, it's our intention to publish it when we've reached conclusions, okay. um, but we're obviously working that through following the autumn statement. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to move on to the next section, if I may, uh, Chairman. Um, I'll let you. Thank you. Uh, disruption on the railways. Um, Secretary of State, your predecessor sent us a letter on the 20th of October when I say sent us, I don't mean the committee, I mean members of parliament, um, outlining the transport strikes minimum service levels bill and the intentions. Uh, could you tell us uh, when we can expect the second reading of that to come forward to the House of Commons? Yes, yeah, so as you know, and, and from the, the way that letter was set out, the bill has been introduced in Parliament. Um, it, it hasn't yet had a, a, a second reading. Um, I can't give the committee a specific time on that. But I would just say, as I've said publicly on that, um, that that may well be, that legislation, a uh, lead to an improvement in the medium to long term. But of course, 
That legislation, however fast it's progressed, given that it's got to go through both the House of Commons and the House of Lords, is not a solution to dealing with the industrial action we see at the moment. Um, the other thing I would say is whilst that legislation may well improve the service that passengers receive on strike days, I think my priority is to try and ensure that we can resolve the industrial dispute so that passengers don't have strike days uh, rather than achieving... That's how you get better service to passengers, is to resolve the disputes rather than have a slightly better service on strike yeah. days. I should have uh, I should declare, Chairman, I apologise, uh, as a former member of the uh, RMT and a former employee of the railways. Uh, uh, I'm sorry I didn't do that. Um, should be accepted Thanks. and you're admonished. Uh, so are we then saying that that legislation actually has little value at all? No, I'm saying that... It, I just, I just, if, if it's not going to affect the situation today, and particularly the coming weeks, because we're seeing considerable strike action, um, is, is that bill actually valuable? So, I'm saying that that bill... Two, two things, I think but both of those things are true. The bill uh, absolutely may well contribute value in the future, um, but it's clearly, given that it would have to go through Parliament, there's a, if you look at the way the bill's drafted, there then has to be some um, agreement and some secondary legislation and quite a bit of work has to take place even when the bill's uh, on the statute book. It's clearly not going to be something that's going to help with the industrial action that we face today. And one of the reasons, as I set out in my opening statement, why I felt it important to meet with the trade union leaders um, and to try and help facilitate working with the Rail Minister um, uh, better talks between both sides, the employers and the unions, is to try and get us to a resolution of the present industrial dispute, conscious that it's going to lead yeah. to okay. terrible um, there inconvenience are many, for passengers. There are, there are many, many millions of people who are adversely affected by these strikes. We have here in Parliament, uh, when necessary, pushed through legislation quite quickly and it can be done, is it no longer the government's intention to push this through uh, rapidly and are they reconsidering it? So, uh, you're right, uh, usually legislation that is pushed through rapidly tends to have to be pushed through uh, when there's cross-party agreement on that legislation and, there's, um, uh, and that I don't think is the case here. Um, but look, it is my uh, firm intention to try and get to a position where we can resolve the industrial dispute. You're absolutely right. It's going to cause uh, enormous inconvenience for passengers, particularly over Christmas. It's also going to cre create tremendous inconvenience for many businesses. And I'm very conscious, for example, with the hospitality industry, you know, who've last couple of Christmas periods have suffered tremendously because of COVID. This was going to be the first uh, Christmas period, which is very busy for the industry, that they were going to be able to trade normally. And I'm, I'm very disappointed that they're going to be damaged, which is why I call on the you know, unions, unions, even at this stage, to call off those strikes at Christmas. But all I'm saying is the legislation um, it sorry, isn't going to be a solution to the industrial dispute I'm today. Get, I'm going to get a kicking for time. But I just wanted to finally ask you then, um, given you met with the unions only last week, and the RMT particularly has continued to call for more strikes. Um, is there real value in the meetings that you have with union leaders if they're just going to continue to call for strike action? Well, look, I always think it's better um, to keep talking than not talking. It's always good to have those channels of communication. Um, I found the meetings that they were constructive meetings. Uh, I think the government did what we said we were going to do. We said we would help facilitate communication between unions and employers and actually following my meeting the employers made a uh, revised offer which I think most people looking at it given that it involves a, a, a reasonable fair pay settlement um, protection against compulsory redundancies for a period uh, and it but it does insist on necessary workforce reform I think most people would think that was fair one trade union is putting that deal, uh, the network rail deal, to its members with a recommendation to accept. Um, that's what I would hope the RMT would do, even at this stage, looking at the inconvenience that they're going to cause to passengers uh, and businesses. But I think keeping talking, keeping those channels of communication open is a good thing, um, rather than the opposite. And just before I hand over to, to Jack to ask you about some of the issues in the north, uh, it's our understanding that the department offered a derogation which was taken 
to South Eastern Railway and South Western Railway about its timetable changes. Um, could you tell us uh, maybe why that is and whether or not they will continue, their derogations going forward will continue? I think the derogation you're talking about is about whether there was uh, consultation um, about that. I, I may just ask the Permanent Secretary to comment on that since that was a decision taken before I was uh, in the department. Uh, it was, I think, the case that um, uh, previous uh, ministers concluded that some timetable changes uh, should not be formally consulted upon. So I think your, 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 your question yeah. is, is accurate. Uh, the question is, will that continue? Are you going to continue to change the timetables without consultation? I think that will be a matter for um, ministers, current ministers. So, uh, no, that was, that was, I mean, you specifically referred to the past decision. I think yeah. going forward, um, we'll look at those circumstances. I, I'll make decisions on that based on all of the circumstances, and it'll depend, it'll depend on case-by-case -case basis, I think. Thank you, Chris. Before we come to Jack, I'm going to come to Graham. But before we come to Graham, I've just got two quick fire questions for you. Of course. Um, your predecessor told us you plan to review and consult on ticket offices imminently. Is that still the department's plan? It is still the case that we are looking at um, the way ticket offices operate. One of the things we're talking to the trade unions part of the discussions is about reforming the way they work. V very few people now, there's only about 12% I think of ticket purchases um, are done in ticket offices. One of the frustrations is you've got staff who are then in those ticket offices not actually able to be used uh, front of house to serve passengers. So one of the things that, we're just, that, that are, the employers are talking to unions about is having those staff uh, retrained, able to come out of the ticket offices and well, provide services from, to state, but, but 12 per cent is still one eighth of the population. That might be elderly population who like dealing in cash. Yes, it is. No, and we, we absolutely want to make sure that those people that want to deal in cash and need to uh, engage physically with purchases and tickets are still able to. But clearly, you don't want to put as much resource into ticket offices and tying the staff to purely working in a ticket office when you've seen the number of tickets being purchased going down from, I think, a third to only just over 10%. So I think you need to have workforce reform, and it's about delivering a better experience to passengers to make sure those staff are able to, to work flexibly, selling tickets when that is required, but also able to, to assist customers uh, in stations, particularly vulnerable and disabled customers who need other sorts of uh, assistance. Mr. Dunn, I know you've referred to the fact that we'd all like to see the intended industrial action um, over the Christmas period not take place, but what consideration have you given for clarification to deferring plan Christmas engineering works, if any? So one of the things that Network Rail is, is now looking at, given the um, strikes that were called uh, by the RMT on Network Rail, is looking at that £120 million worth of essential maintenance work to see the extent to which that's affected and of course even though that may not impact passenger services it absolutely will affect the reliability of the railway and of course it's done at Christmas because although I recognise it sometimes causes inconvenience to people at Christmas it is done then because that is the least busy time uh, to do it. If that work isn't done at the Christmas period it means it will have to be done at other times of the year which will cause more inconvenience to passengers. So Network Rail is working through what changes it may have to take place with its engineering work uh, in response to the strike action that's been called by the RMT. I have a number of questions and lots more to get through so I'm going to move on to Graham Morris. Uh, thanks Chair uh, and, and good morning to uh, the Secretary of State the panel. I've got a couple of questions on the rail dispute mm -hmm. and uh, um, a, a couple of observations as well, but um, just in relation to your comments there about the, um, the um, proposed uh, minimum standards uh, rail bill, uh, which will be hugely controversial, I don't think anyone's in any doubt that will completely sour industrial relations at a time when we're trying to build uh, a, a settlement. But why is it, Secretary of State, that there's time for this controversial piece of legislation that's been driven by your department, and yet apparently there isn't time to, do, to deal with quite a number of issues identified by my colleagues uh, regarding pavement parking, regarding the regulation of e-scooters, of autonomous vehicles and so on, where there is a cross-party agreement that we need to crack on with yep. these. Yep. It seems, it seems yep. slightly perverse that we can find time for one hugely controversial yep. piece of legislation uh, and not for another. Well, I, I'd say a couple of things. First of all, uh, Mr Morris, I think you've um, confirmed 
what I was implying in, in my answer to Mr Loder, which is that taking that legislation forward rapidly, um, the minimum service levels legislation would, would not be possible since there wouldn't be a, a cross-party agreement and you, you need that if we you're going to... We have shorter answers without repetition would be really helpful because we've got a lot to get and through. Let's answer this question. Yeah, 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 yes, of course. I, I, look, I, I, I'll, it's, a, it's a balance, Mr Bradshaw. I'm trying to give full answers, but I, I said if you wish me to move a little more... You don't need to repeat things you've already said. Very happy to do so. Um, So uh, I welcome that. On on your issue about balancing these things off, that legislation, of course, was already introduced uh, in this session. The the wider transport bill, um, my predecessor, I think, confirmed it wouldn't be taking place this session, um, and I've made it clear in answer to my earlier question that it's got a range of things in it which are priorities for me, but I need to make that case with colleagues in government. I understand. You, You did explain that earlier, and I appreciate that. Um, can, can I ask now, particularly about the rail dispute, and I, I do support your your philosophy of continuing to talk, and I, I'm heartened by the fact that the um, the rail freight operating companies, mm-hmm. um, the uh, Scottish government, the Welsh government, and I think the, the open access train operating companies have all reached settlements with the rail unions. So it must be possible, it, it's not an impossible task to, to achieve a settlement but they haven't placed preconditions in relation to ticket office closures or the acceptance of driver-only operated trains. Uh, Is there any prospect of continuing to uh, um, uh, continue the talks to secure such a settlement um, if these preconditions are attached? Well, I don't want to get too far into specific details because I do think it's important that negotiations take place between the employers and the unions and, and, and I think both sides accept that. On, the, more, on the, the, the overall stance though, I do think it's important that, that this isn't just a dispute about, about pay, it is a dispute also about modernising the railway and having workforce reform. And as I said, in in my opening statement, I think I captured, I do think in order for the railways to have a sustainable future, we do have to see reform in the way they operate. It isn't going to be sustainable for the taxpayer to continue to put in the sums it has put in um, without seeing that reform. It's the reform generates the savings that help fund the pay rise and I think both of those things are part of the, the debate and but I think I, keeping talking is very but, valuable. But, but except you said I'm sure the trade unions appreciate that no, over a long period of time the first job I ever had I was a member of the NUI even even before uh, uh, my colleague Chris Lord who was a twinkle I, 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 was, a, <laughs> I, was, a, I was I was a member of the Aaron railway Buggles. union I, um, before it was the RMT but, but, but you know and, and over a long period of time they've ex- uh, accepted changes modernisation reforms uh, 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 and so on but one of the things that, that we've identified as a committee in relation to another inquiry we're doing about access for disabled people are the concerns about if there are um, a closure of ticket offices if there are stations without staff if there are driver only operated trains how this will how does that square with our commitment under the uh, Equality and Human Rights uh, um, um, Commission requirements to ensure that disabled and elderly and vulnerable people can access the the, uh, the railways? And is that not a factor in your negotiations? Is a more gradual approach not more more likely to, to be beneficial? Because we'll have to address these legal considerations, won't we? Yeah. Privacy. Sorry, y- sorry. Yes, look, yeah. I, I, look, on the general point, I do want to make sure the railways are very accessible. Uh, you, you may well know um, in my ministerial history I was the Minister for Disabled People. I take this very seriously. It's one of the reasons in setting out portfolios for, for my ministerial team I've made sure everyone has a responsibility to deliver accessible transport. Um, so part of the reason, what, what all the government said is that we need to see that reform. It is important that the detail of that reform, how you deliver it, the time scale over which you deliver it, and the flexibility of the staff and making sure there's proper um, service for customers is very important. That's why the detail needs to be hammered out between the employers, both uh, on, on the points you're talking about, the train operating companies, uh, and the unions, the detail needs to be hammered out. But I think the principle of reform is very valuable. You know, in answer to my question on ticket office, I made the point: you don't want people tied to sitting behind a desk 
not serving very many customers. I want them to be able to also to serve customers in the station. The detail of how that works is for the unions and the employers to hammer out between them, which is why I want to see them continuing to talk to reach an agreement that they feel that, that the unions can then recommend to their members. I, I just want to very quickly refer to, an, I'm, I'm not a Telegraph World reader, I must confess, uh, but, but there is an article in the Telegraph today which suggests that the Treasury or Number 10 are insisting on a precondition before the negotiations where c can move forward of the unions accepting driver-only operation. Uh, I, I don't know what the time frame is or if that's just in principle, but are you in a position to confirm or deny that that, that report's correct? Well, I, I haven't seen the report, so I, I, I can't really comment on it. I haven't seen it. O on the specific point about, about driver-only operation, we've obviously seen that on, on quite a significant part of the railway already, so <coughs> I don't think there's an in-principle um, objection to it. I know that it is controversial, um, but, but you know it's something that exists on the railways already. In terms of what I want to see, I mean, I'm, I want the two sides to continue talking. The government has facilitated. I was asked to facilitate um, an improved offer. Uh, it was made clear to me when I met Mr Lynch that you know, on the train operating side there hadn't been an offer. There now has been an offer. Um, I would urge the two sides to continue talking, the unions to call off the strikes. I think that's the right thing for passengers and I think it's also the right thing for the... Sorry, the Secretary, ben, we, we've heard ben, that message countless times. So there, there was a major... There was a, a front ben, page ben, ben, in the ben, Daily Telegraph ben, on Monday ben, alleged ben, that Number 10 had ben, intervened wait, and put driver only trains on the wait. table. Excuse me, Chair, this is really important. The, the, important, the Secretary of State is getting away with that without we answering the place. question. You said I was coming after, after Graham. You said I was coming well, after Graham. Jack, Jack has been waiting me. very patiently to well, ask questions. I will come back you in after. Question, I will come back in. And Secretary of State, if you'll you, you you answer it, then we'll so, move to Jack. It, you, you, you can't claim you didn't see the splash on Monday in the Daily Telegraph claiming number 10 at the last minute has added driver-only trains as an issue to this, this dispute. Was that report incorrect? Well, I, I was specifically talking, Mr. Morris asked me a question about a report today, which I, I haven't seen. It was seen. on Monday. On, on the, the general The point, Secretary of State, did you not see this report, and is it true? Uh, no. The, the, I've been very clear that we've... Uh, I, I was asked to facilitate the a issue new of offer. driver-only trains being introduced by the Number 10 or the Treasury at the last minute. It wasn't on the table no, before. On, on reform, we're very clear. No, we answer need the to question. See, we're very clear answer we need to see reform. The question. On, on the specifics about detail, detailed negotiations are taking place between employers and trade unions. It's not the government's role to micromanage the detail of the reform. So but we've been clear that we do need to see work Train operators reform. and the unions both say that this issue has been inserted in the last week by Number 10 or the Treasury, which has scuppered a deal that was on the table. Well, uh, that is what the, both the train operators and the unions. Just have told on that us. point about scuppering a deal, when that was already on the table, when I met um, Mr. Lynch, he made it very clear to me that he hadn't had an offer uh, on the train operating side of the house. There, there had been an offer on Network Rail. Um, I met with the trade unions. I was asked to facilitate. <coughs> Uh, an improvement. We then saw. That wasn't we then, my question. We're not then, answering the well, question. Well, no, I, I'm. Well, I am telling you what's been going on. There, there was then an improved offer to the unions from Network Rail, and an offer then came on the train operating side of the house uh, that the unions could consider. Uh, I regret that they rejected that offer. I think it would have been better if they'd continued talking to try and hammer out some detail. So there haven't be, been... You won't then, answer the question, why do you think Scotland and Wales have settled? There haven't been... Why do you think they've settled? There haven't been preconditions. Yes, there needs to be reform. I've been very clear. You have to have reform to drive the savings. Um, and I'm telling you what's going on. I'm, I'm not going to give a, provide a running commentary yeah. you're, you're, avo you're, you're avoiding the question. You want to know who's pulling the yeah, we, we're avoiding the question. I mean, the public want to know what's going on here. They have a right to know if Number 10 intervened to stop a deal by adding driver only trains no. at the last minute, which is what the companies, not the unions, the companies say no, happened. No one is trying to stop a deal, quite the reverse. Uh, I met with the trade unions, I, I felt that conversation was important, um, and actually we then saw a, 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 a more an improved deal coming on both sides, both the train operating companies and network rail. We're trying to reach a deal here, it's the trade unions that have rejected, or the RMT that's rejected, and I think that's regrettable, and I've said it's very disappointing from the point of view of passengers. I'm very clear, I want to see a deal reached 
Um, I think we could have avo avoided the Christmas chaos. Yeah, number, 10 of, reached, number 10 have now uh, guaranteed I think we Christmas reached, chaos. We haven't made a fair and reasonable... reasonable. It's not even answering the question. It's not even ben, everybody the question, can watch ben. and the record will show. You've asked your questions. Uh, the Secretary of State I'm has answered them. The, the public will have ben, seen you haven't ben, answered the question. Thank you, Ben. Question. And you might not like the answer, but there is a fair and reasonable offer on the table, and I think it's regrettable that the RMT is going ahead with strikes rather than putting that offer to its members. Ben, thank you, Ben. Secretary of State, we're moving on a little bit behind time, but Jack, thank you very much for your patience. The thank floor you. is yours. Thank you, Chair. And firstly, why is it that rail services are particularly so bad in, in the north and parts of the Midlands? Well, the the the, the reason for the recent um, downturn in, in uh, performance is, is largely, not, not entirely, but, but largely to do with the fact that um, there's been two, two, two issues, I think. Partly there's been a driver shortage, uh, which occurred as a result of the pandemic and the fact that there was a, a lack of driver training. So that's been, that's been one of the causes. Um, we've worked, the department's worked closely with the uh, train operating companies to get those drivers trained and we've seen a, a significant increase in driver availability which has improved matters. The other issue is that, and this comes back to the need for workforce, workforce reform, too much of the timetable is dependent on what's called rest day working which is where drivers have to volunteer to work on d uh, days. Uh, in order to deliver a timetable. That means that the railway is not very sustainable because if those drivers stop working on those rest days, um, you end up with trains being cancelled at the last minute um, and a very flaky and unreliable service. And that is what we have seen um, on both Transpennine Express and on Avanti West Coast. Um, and that's not acceptable. So um, one of the things that uh, Avanti is going, is, is we're expecting them to do with their new December timetable which kicks in on the 11th of December there'll be a very significant increase in the service <coughs> that they're offering the only the, the only tragedy for passengers and I heard this loud and clear when I met with northern mayors last week the tragedy is because of the industrial action that improved timetable which would both have more services more reliably delivered passengers are not going to see the benefit of that because almost as soon as that new timetable kicks in there's going to be a set of uh, national industrial action. So, again, another reason why I hope it stops. So, I want to part of the reason why we need workforce reform is to get rid of this reliance on rest day working, to have a proper seven day railway so that we have a reliable service for all of those people that need a reliable train service, whether it's to get to work, to see members of their family, or to do all the important things that they have to do. And I think that would, that would help secure the long term future of the railway. As you've suggested, Avanti are proposing to increase their uh, number of trains every day from 180 to 264. Do you have any confidence that they'll be able to actually run those trains? Well, if I just let me just put aside, and I'll try to keep Mr. Bradshaw happy, not repeat myself. Um, putting aside industrial action, if the industrial action wasn't taking place then um, I do think they would be able to deliver that. There has been a, a, a significant uh, number of new drivers. The I, I think they're able to deliver that timetable. Previously, I was <coughs> promised uh, in October that we would see, uh, with the September uh, changes to the timetable, that we would see near enough re return of full services, and that failed to materialise. So we have been here and seen this before, haven't we? So why should we now assume that... Uh, from uh, December to the time, December timetable changes that we are actually going to see all of these trains uh, being restored? Well, uh, let me answer that first and then I may just ask Bernadette to comment on the, the previous yeah. um, implementation. So we've been working very closely with the department, to, uh, with the uh, company to test you know, the drivers that, that they have available, the robustness of whether they think they can, of whether we think they can deliver that timetable. Um, uh, we think they can. Um, as I said, the, the difficulty is, and I, I'm very clear, I want to hold Avanti to account to deliver the services that they've promised for passengers. One of the difficulties is I can hold them to account for things they can control. Um, the, thing that's, the thing that's going to stop me being able to do that is, is the um, industrial action, because um, they're going to perfectly reasonably be able to turn around if they don't deliver that timetable and point to the industrial action. So I want a period where we don't have industrial action, where we can hold them to account. They've made some clear commitments. 
we think they can deliver those commitments, and I want to see them deliver those for passengers. But, but they're clearly not going to deliver those commitments if two days after they roll out the new timetable, we see um, four days of industrial action. And Bernadette, do you want to just comment on, on Mr Brereton's yes. reasonable point on no, the September timetable? Indeed, and I think, in fairness, um, I think we are stress testing these plans, recognising that sort of over-promising and under-delivering only sort of exacerbates the um, a frustration that passengers and people feel about services. I think a lot more work has been done now to uh, deal with the backlog of driver training and to reduce the reliance on rest day working, which is why uh, we believe this should be a more... Um, deliverable uh, now proposition uh, so uh, I, I think lessons have been learned by the company and um, certainly my department working with the company to ensure that is the case um, as the Secretary of State rightly says uh, industrial action will uh, uh, will prevent those service levels from being delivered there is also an ongoing I think issue which I know the company is working uh, hard with ASLEF on to ensure that ASLEF is cooperating on rosters as well so it is also uh, dependent upon that. So, uh, but as I say, uh, certainly my department has been working closely with the Vanity to make sure that uh, this new timetable is one which they can effectively deliver. Vanity services have seen, uh, in terms of the number of trains on time, has been less than half. Uh, so, you know, the, the previous Secretary of State didn't take the contract off of Vanity. Do you think that decision was a mistake? So, look, I, I had, I've had quite strong opinions expressed to me both by, by colleagues in Parliament and also when I met the Northern Mayors last week about what they think should happen to the, the uh, contract and I, and I asked them, for example, to write to me to set out their views with, with the evidence. Um, I'm focused on delivering better services for passengers. I mean, decisions will be taken in due course about what happens to the contract. I think at the moment, the, the best thing we can do is to, hold, is to try and get them to deliver against their um, uh, promises. As I said, we have been stress testing um, and kicking the tyres on their promises, um, the, the reduced reliance on rest day working, the increased number of drivers. So we think they can deliver these promises. I mean, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating, but uh, it is going to be disrupted by the industrial action. So, uh, I, but I'm very focused. I've heard from, from colleagues who use that service. I've heard from members of the public. I've heard from others who are engaged with it. And of course, it's worth saying that the regime that these companies get paid under, there's a small amount which is a fixed fee, but a bigger amount is based on their performance, and that's independently assessed. And that determines how much money they earn from the contract. So the company is very well aware that if it doesn't deliver, um, it, 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 that will impact the amount of money that it receives. And are you from the looking taxpayer. at potential financial penalties on Avanti and on uh, TransPennine? Well, the way the contract is set up, there's a half a percent is is a is a fixed fee, but one and a half percent of 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 the fee is based on their performance, and that's independently assessed. So, if they don't deliver the things they say they're going to deliver, then that will materially impact the fee they get from um, the department for running those services. So, they're very well aware of that, and I'm very well aware of the service at the moment is simply not acceptable. Um, for customers um, who aren't able to rely on it at the moment. And I'm very clear, if we're going to, to have a long-term future for the railway, we need a reliable service that passengers can count on in every part of the country. Many passengers have been impacted by very short-term changes as well, less than 48 hours in some cases of timetable changes, tickets not being available for sale at all in some cases. So have you looked at the wider implications of this, you know, the social, the economic implications of this decision because of how short-term and how uh, significant the impacts have been on, on passengers? Yes, I have. I'm very conscious, and I've listened to, to many of the, the stories about how people have been impacted, that you know, not having a reliable service, having th trains cancelled at short notice when people then can't change their journeys very easily, it has a massive impact on people's ability to go to work, people's ability to attend important appointments, to attend education, um, and, and impacts a lot on businesses as well, and people being able to travel to... Uh, you know, large events, for example. That was a point made very strongly to me uh, when I m met the um, Northern Mayors last week. They made a very strong point about the impact on their um, regional economy, which is why I think it's so very important that we get those services being delivered as they should be and as promised. In terms of network rail as well, and, and Ben and I uh, hosted uh, the OOR 
uh, yesterday for a briefing with uh, parliamentarians. And the AOR have, have raised quite a lot of concerns about network rail's performance as well. Every uh, region uh, of network rail has been uh, performing worse than they did previously uh, in terms of the delays that they are causing uh, to the rail industry. So what are you doing to ensure that network rail are performing and addressing these uh, issues that we're seeing? So, I mean, w one of the issues, of course, is to try and get network rail and the train operating companies to work more closely together. So part of, you know, going back to my answer to, to Mr. Loder, part of what we're doing is trying to get those two parts of the industry to work more closely together. Um, uh, and I'm very conscious that we need to reduce the, the impact. And it's part of the reason why it's going to be disappointing that we don't get as much um, of the maintenance work done over the Christmas period because you need to do it when the railway is less busy so that you have a more reliable railway. Um, one of the things I took into account when we signed off the um, uh, high-level uh, output specification and the, and the uh, periodic review um, budget that we just signed off was to make sure we continue investing in today's railway to keep up the uh, quality and the performance of the network as well as investing in new railways. So that's one of the things that I will keep a continuing focus on. I don't know whether the Permanent Secretary wants to add anything to my well, I'm just going to interrupt as, you, as you're asking your, your colleague, um, Secretary of State. I'm conscious that has gone half ten. We are still on rail. We have a lot to get Okay. Through. So brevity in answers, but colleagues particularly brevity in questions, please, as we move forward. Of course. That's okay. Um, I, I don't think I have a great deal to add to what the Secretary of State said. I mean, I certainly would emphasise I'm not sure what the particular issues uh, around performance or are, uh, were raising with you and colleagues yesterday were. Um, well, it, they have, they've stated very clearly that uh, in their latest in their figures latest. that every single one of the five regions of network rail um, are, are performing worse than they were, um, and this is having an impact on um, the, the, the delays of services. And so this is the uh, maintenance, the normal maintenance and mm -hmm. renewal type of activity. Um, so first thing I would say is there has been an absolute transformation already in the way that network rail uh, works with operators over recent years and that is continuing. I can certainly remember when I was first involved in rail, um, network rail and operators were sort of often warring factions and I think uh, there is now enormous cooperation and uh, joint planning of uh, things like uh, works to minimise disruption and generally speaking I think NR performs very very much better than it has historically in those areas. Um, obviously where there's a deterioration in performance then we expect uh, our, our to, to hold them to account and we in the department will hold them uh, to account too. Clearly NR themselves have also been impacted by industrial action which will not have improved performance in, uh, in recent months. What are you doing to try and get Network Rail to work more collaboratively with local partners, with other uh, organisations? Because we've seen, as Secretary of State knows, some serious problems with trying to deliver our Transforming Cities Fund investment in Stoke-on-Trent. What are you doing to make sure that Network Rail are obliged to work with local authorities, with other local key stakeholders, to actually deliver the public transport improvements that we need to see? Uh, I think the regional structure that Network Rail now has was precisely um, introduced uh, in order to ensure that there is that much more effective working. That NR, I mean, it is true again historically, NR was something of a sort of sort of national monolith, and I know that local stakeholders uh, used to find it very frustrating engaging well, with NR. I think they still are, and it may not be perfect, and I'm sure there's always room for improvement. But the regional structure. Um, now is absolutely designed to ensure that the sort of focus of the leadership team within NR is absolutely on building that closer engagement uh, with local stakeholders and partners and operators and also thinking about those wider questions as you rightly say about integration with other forms of transport so I think uh, I think uh, some very significant steps and improvements have been made in recent years uh, but I don't think NR and if Andrew Haynes was here I don't think he'd claim that there is no room for, con uh, for further improvement. I want to move on now to discuss a bit about rail infrastructure and particularly around uh, Northern Powerhouse Rail and the proposals uh, for Northern Powerhouse Rail. And the uh, option one was selected by the government, and uh, but transport is transport for North least preferred option. So why is it that option one has been uh, selected uh, by the government? Well, the commitment that we've made to Northern Powerhouse Rail, the core network is remains as it was set out in the integrated rail plan. 
um, and the Chancellor confirmed in, I mean, one of the first questions I got asked, uh, this, this was one of the first sets of questions I got asked when I uh, was appointed to this role, the Chancellor's confirmed um, that we're committed to delivering um, the core Northern Powerhouse Rail Network. Clearly, I have already you know, found in this job there are lots of people with views about how we do that, um, exactly how we lay it out. Uh, one of the conversations I had last week with Northern Mayors was, was there a range of views about how we take on the further stages, um, uh, and we're, we're, we continue to listen to them. But the, the core Northern Powerhouse Rail Network, as set out in the Integrated Rail Plan, remains the government's um, commitment um, that we're committed to delivering. Are you still undertaking work to reappraise uh, options for Northern Powerhouse Rail? So we're looking at, we, we've set out what we're planning on doing. There are things we are going to um, continue to look at. So um, the Prime Minister made some um, commitments about how we deliver uh, high-speed services um, to Bradford, uh, and we shall continue looking at how we do that. Um, so there are still things um, that we're looking at, but the core network is the commitment that we've set out um, in the Integrated Rail Plan, and that remains. So the you haven't got position. a firm option yet. Then. Well, shall I just yeah. say because I think your question was about why the proposals that are currently in the Integrated Rail Plan were those uh, those were chosen, which I think predates. Uh, what we're trying the to Secretary understand State. is whether you are still, you know, focused on this option one that you. Put forward as the proposals um, uh, through the integrated rail plan is is that now the option or is there still work underway to reappraise and look at alternatives these are still this is still the same core plan as the secretary of state has said uh, connectivity to bradford is something which uh, i know he wants to look at and the prime minister has indicated he wishes to do uh, but there is not now a sort of reopening of uh, the core elements of the integrated rail plan obviously in putting that plan together, uh, previous government was balancing on the one hand the need for and the desire to make a very, very significant and transformational investment uh, in rail in the north with the uh, broader uh, demands of sort of affordability. Uh, that is what the plan does. Um, if all of the, uh, you may recall it's a 96.4 billion pound plan, I think the National Infrastructure Commis uh, Commission um, calculated that if if the government had done everything that all stakeholders had asked for, including transport for the north, it would have been a 185 billion pound plan, and obviously um, that was uh, uh, judged to be unaffordable. So it's a balance between, say, commitment to transformational uh, investment and also needing to um, take a realistic view of what what is what is affordable in the long term. With the development of HS2, there's going to be increasing focus now. Obviously, the eastern leg is there's change plans there. There's going to be an increasing reliance upon services running onto the existing network, onto the classic network. So, what are you doing to ensure that the investment that's needed, because there is investment that's needed on the classic network, to facilitate those HS2 trains? For example, it leads also my own area in Stoke-on-Trent. We need some investment in the classic network. What are you doing to make sure that Network Rail are actually putting forward that investment to facilitate HS2 services? Well, two things. I think it's worth saying that, um, and, and um, Mr Loder talked about the Arnet plan, it's worth just saying I think that the investment in the uh, non-HS2 rail network, uh, the capital spending, the the bulk of that is going to be taking place outside London and the South East. So actually there's been a, a, a rebalancing of where we spend our rail capital investment that's not HS2 to, to spread that more fairly across the whole country. So there'll be very significant investment in the, the north of England. Uh, and one of the things that we're very clear about is making sure that we look at HS2 and Network Rails plans together to make sure that, that they interact properly. Um, as I said, but the, the core network is what we've set out in the Integrated Rail Plan and that remains the government's position. And, and yes, I know there are many people that would have liked us to have settled on different plans, but it's about balancing the investment. I mean, I think it's worth saying, which, you know, a lot of focus goes on the things that 
we're not doing and the things that people didn't get. But it is worth just saying that, you know, as I said at the beginning, we are maintaining our £20 billion investment in capital on transport, which is a very significant piece of investment. And the government's maintaining its investment in infrastructure. So I would, I would continue to argue that you know, it's a very significant driver of economic growth and a very significant commitment to all parts of the UK or, um, from this government on transport. <coughs> The final question I just wanted to ask relates to that, and it's about the methodology that's used to assess uh, projects. And there are a lot of concerns about this that have been raised previously about you know, how it's able to fully capture the benefits, particularly for those areas where levelling up is more mm -hmm. important uh, and capture those, uh, the, the ability of that growth potential. Um, are, are you concerned and do you think that the department have still got this right in terms of the methodology that is being used and that this will you know, deliver on uh, the levelling up aspirations of the government? So you're right to highlight the levelling up aspirations of the government. One of the reasons why we're, we're committed to the, the core Northern Powerhouse Rail Network is exactly to join up um, the cities of the north to, to get those agglomeration benefits. Um, uh, I think the department's got, from, from my experience of it so far, the department, I think, has got a very good team of analysts who try and pull all of this information together um, to try and weigh up and balance all of these projects. Um, you can do a lot of that. I mean, to some extent, you always have to put some judgment in it, and the government's going to have some strategic priorities. So I think it has to take all the analytical work, all of the attempt to boil these things down to numbers. But there is some judgment involved about what our strategic priorities are. So I think you have to weigh those things up. And that's why decisions are taken by ministers, because you've got a lot of data. But ultimately, there's some strategic judgment to take as well. Can, can, I, can I just add a word on this? Um, I know the department's uh, kind of analytical modelling and our, our transport appraisal methodology is often challenged. Uh, just to say, firstly, uh, we are constantly seeking to improve and evaluate. I think it is actually a very good analytical set of tools. Um, it is very important. It's something we value and uh, put a lot of effort into in the department. We are constantly seeking to improve. But already within our modelling, we are very conscious and we explicitly identify the fact there are always going to be wider impacts which cannot be quantified. Uh, and that is very much a part of our decision-making process to acknowledge and recognise those wider impacts. As the Secretary of State has indicated, what the government is also now doing is putting more weight on the strategic case uh, alongside a sort of standard business case in making the decisions that it does uh, about, um, uh, about these investments. And I do think, particularly for these very large uh, long-term and transformational investments, that's, uh, that's uh, a very important um, uh, sort of evolution of how we think about these things. Thank you, Jack. Um, before I go on to Greg Smith, who's asking the next round of questions, I'm just going to warn the witnesses, if you do answer in a very elongated fashion, I will cut you off and ask your question to ask the next question. Is that okay? We have a lot to get through. Greg. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Secretary of State, the autumn awesome statement made a big commitment on East-West Rail. What is your understanding of what that actually means? Is that the whole project as it was originally conceived, including the Aylesbury Spur, or just Oxford through to Cambridge? Um, so the overall commitment that Chancellor made, I think, was to set a very clear uh, impression, given that he'd confirmed the overall spending that the government was still committed to that project um, for the and, and I think he set out subsequently that's the whole um, line from Oxford to Cambridge on your specific question uh, I'm going to I'm either going to ask the permanent secretary to comment a lot or I'm going to uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to write to you on the detail of that I'm, I recognize the complexity of these things and the planning implications and I don't want to get them wrong I don't know whether Bernadette wants to add anything I, 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 I think it is safer to write I mean at the moment oh, then, thank you very much Greg thank you. okay round. is it still the intention to launch uh, the first part of East West Rail which is very nearly built on diesel only rolling stock I don't know the answer to that question. I think we are uh, looking at the question of the um, diesel and electrification still in relation to East West Rail, and there are quite a number of decisions yet to be taken on, on how that will work. So the, the question there is less about electrification or not, because I think the ship has sailed on that because most of it's built. By mode, I think. It's, yeah. Whether it's by mode or hydrogen yeah, mode. or whatever it might be, because as it stands, with big net zero commitments mm -hmm. and the length of life of rolling stock at the moment, the plan is, as I understand it, to launch with diesel. That can't be a sensible decision, can it? 
So that would be the um, stage um, one from Bletchley, uh, from Bletchley to Milton Keynes, I guess, where obviously we're much more advanced uh, and the uh, construction is already underway. Uh, let me check with you exactly what the rolling stock expectation is for that section. Clearly, for the later stages through to Cambridge, um, there are many more. These are at a much earlier stage of development, uh, and the questions, I think, about the rolling stock will be also at a much earlier stage of development. OK, thank you. Um, perhaps more broadly, uh, East West Rail from Oxford to Bletchley has brought an old railway back to life. Beyond Bletchley is a new cutting. Before any work is done on starting beyond Bletchley towards Cambridge, will you do a full review of the lessons, particularly the impacts on communities along the line of route, especially businesses, to understand what has gone wrong in the construction of the first part? Well, we will always listen very carefully to lessons. I mean, it's a constant part of our uh, project delivery to, to, to re-evaluate and learn lessons as we go. Um, I'd be very interested in following up with Mr Smith exactly uh, the problems that you and local businesses have experienced and talking to East West Rail about those and absolutely uh, all of the lessons from this stage one we will want to fully process and ensure we're taking into account in later stages. Thank you. That, that's all I have on rail. I want to turn to road uh, particularly passenger vehicles at the moment. Again, in the autumn statement, we saw uh, fairness come back in the way all vehicle types are taxed, with electric vehicles no longer getting a freebie. Did the Department of Transport feed into that? Was that wholly a Treasury decision? Well, I think, first of all, the um, tax measures, as you know, are matters mm. for the Chancellor. Uh, I, I'm not going to trespass on those. I think the uh, implementation of vehicle excise duty, um, I think, is very sensible. I don't think it, it makes a significant difference to purchasing decisions, but it clearly answers one question about vehicle excise duty being available, and that's important for, for the revenue that we then get for investment in roads. So I think that's a, a, a welcome decision, but um, as you know, tax matters are matters for the Chancellor. Um, my question was more, did the DFT feed into that process at all? Uh, but, but within that, perhaps I could ask the extent to which you believe the roads budget for either building new roads, improving our existing roads, uh, getting money to councils to manage the roads they run, will go up as a result of more vehicles paying vehicle excise duty? Well, I think, as I said in answer to the question earlier on the autumn statement, I'm very pleased that we got our spending review budgets confirmed. Um, one of the things I'm doing at the moment obviously is looking at the balance of spending between uh, capital on rail uh, and on roads. I'm very conscious, as, as I said earlier, that you know the, the majority of journeys are taken uh, undertaken on roads uh, and I want to make sure we invest in our road network, both the strategic network and what we uh, provide for local roads to make sure people can, we can keep the country moving both in terms of passenger vehicles and also freight. That, that, that's helpful. Do you think looking at the dynamic again between incentives that were previously offered for people to buy EVs, that we are still on track for the 2030 ban on new petrol and diesel? Um, I, I do, as you know, but part of the challenge about how you deploy public money is to do it in a way that um, gets us to a model where the private sector can then take over. So, you know, the initial uh, in incentives we put in place for electric vehicles um, actually have done their, their work and we're seeing a very significant mm -hmm. uptake in um, electric vehicles as far as passenger cars are confirmed. Um, one of the things the department's also got to do is look at how we uh, accelerate or deal with the gaps for rolling out charging. So there's a lot of private investment going into charging and there are some areas where the department will put public money in to make sure that we can continue rolling that out. But yes, I think we I think we are on track. How much is the department looking at other emerging <coughs> technologies, hydrogen, direct hydrogen combustion, hydrogen fuel cells, synthetic fuels on top of EVs? So I think the uh, I think I'm right in saying that the department's always been uh, technology neutral. Mm -hmm. So the objective is to get to 
our net zero objectives, but we're not wedded to particular technologies. And, and I think um, Gareth said in yeah. one of his earlier answers, and um, when he was talking about when we talk about the regulatory regime, actually we want to uh, incentivise companies to look at all of those things. So uh, exa exactly what the share of those will be going forward, I mean, that will depend on the development of the technology and the private investment, but we're, it's a technology-neutral approach. And clearly I've already picked up in the time I've been doing this job that for different for, for different roles, for different sorts of vehicles, there may well be different technology solutions, um, and we're very much encouraging all of those. I don't know whether you want to add anything, Gareth. Yeah, I think it's fair to say, on cars, it does feel like the momentum's with electric. I think you've sort of seen that on the back of what Tesla have done, uh, in terms of the, and certainly the numbers we see of new car sales. You know, 20% now have a plug in November, so you can see the momentum going. Demand is not an issue. We see, we've, we've taken away some of the financial incentives more of the constraints are on the supply side with the global disruption in supply chains, particularly around chips. Um, vans similarly look like more moving towards electric. There's still a big debate in trucks, particularly over 26 tonnes. Will it be hydrogen fuel cells? I was recently with Scania, and they have the very still a mix of ammonia, hydrogen, potentially even nuclear. Um, on aviation, sustainable aviation fuels, and you mentioned synthetic fuels, very much seen as a core technology for the next, I was going to call it a bridging technology, but this is sort of 30 years at least, given the uh, asset cycles. Question about the role of hydrogen and quite how long that will go. Battery planes, and I mentioned people like Vertical Aerospace before, very interesting on the more short haul for the UK domestic scene. That, that, that's very interesting. I, I, want, I do want to keep these questions specifically to passenger cars, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, just for a couple of more quick questions. There's a lot of focus on the EV market, on the new sales from 2030. How much thought is being put into how we keep all the other cars that are on the road, potentially up to 30 million of them, yeah. running beyond 2030, potentially in a greener way, by which I really do come back to the synthetic fuel point? And how big of a priority is it to keep those cars on the road rather than to see mass scrappage schemes or things that will inevitably involve taxpayer subsidy in order to help people move on? Clearly the, clearly the um, legislative priorities is on new vehicles um, and you're right that and certainly from a carbon point of view you, you have to balance those capital assets that have already been produced. You don't want them all being scrapped too soon because actually that's not great from a carbon emissions point of view either. Um, uh, I, I've spent most of my time so far looking at the, the EV rollout for new vehicles. I don't know whether Gareth wants yeah. to add anything, otherwise, otherwise we'll write to you. Yeah, otherwise, my, my main point would be in fact, we're, we are conscious of the embedded carbon in the, in the vehicle stock on the road. So it's not just, obviously there's a focus on emissions uh, at the tailpipe for particularly around air quality reasons as well, but we're also looking at how we manage the overall stock and can ensure the maintenance and improve the efficiency. The medium okay. My, my last area I want to talk about uh, for roads is smart motorways. Uh, these have been a controversial subject for some years now. Uh, it was this committee's recommendations that led to one of your predecessors uh, pausing the new rollout. But just last month we had a seven hour outage on stop vehicle detection. Uh, coming up into what now sees, appears to be strike season, uh, there is a, there's been media reports that those that, the human beings that monitor the technology uh, for stop vehicle detection may well be on the strikers list. Should we just go a bit further and restore hard shoulders on all these roads until we can be confident the technology actually works? Secretary, coming into the role fresh, what, what is your approach to smart motorways? So, uh, first of all, I think it's worth saying that I think the committee um, uh, did a very good job, I think, on, on the, the, the work that it did. It certainly was stuff that I paid attention to before I came into this role. I think the commitment um, that my predecessors made, uh, I think, still stands, which is about um, pausing the rollout of the, the various types of smart motorways until we've collected a, a, a a larger series of, of data. So I, I, that position hasn't changed. I think that's the position I'm comfortable with maintaining. Uh, on your specific 
point. Um, I'll set out what I think the position is, and, and no doubt Bernadette will correct me. On National Highway staff, those involved in monitoring um, all of our road network, um, you're right that there, there have been strikes um, announced. I think the um, number of staff in National Highways who are members of the trade union who may well be striking is a relatively small number. One of the things the department's very experienced in <coughs> is managing uh, those operational issues and focusing resources on the most important areas. So I don't think we're anticipating um, any significant issues from a road safety perspective. Um, as a result of any of the strike days that have been announced. And I think if, if, I've, I can, if I got that... Th that is exactly right. I mean, it's about 11% of National <coughs> Highway staff or PCS members, which is the striking union. About half of those voted for strike action. So um, National Highways is not expecting a sort of mass... Uh, walk out of staff on strike days and it has robust contingency plans to deal with the strike um, impacts and obviously it will be prioritising in those plans um, road safety um, activities. So I think some of the reports have been somewhat exaggerated about the impact on the road network. Okay, thank you. Chairman. Just on that, Secretary of State, I'm just going to ask you very bluntly, do you believe smart motorways are smart? Smart or safe? Well, in terms of are they smart, I've looked at the, I've looked at the evidence uh, on them that has been collected so far. Uh, I think it's very sensible of my predecessors to say we're going to collect more uh, evidence. Um, I think we're, uh, we're going to be publishing some statistics on uh, safety uh, going forward. I think one of the things we have made a commitment about, which I'm very clear about, we have got to take the public with us on this, so whatever the data says, People have to be comfortable with them. I don't them. think the public are with you. One of the say. things, one of the things we've set out is about um, investing in more um, emergency areas on those um, smart motorways that don't have hard shoulders to reassure people. But I'm very clear there's a there's a point about data and about facts, but there's also a point about making sure that people feel um, safe and comfortable using. Uh, the various types of smart motorways. But would you and feel safe or comfortable on a right? motorway that you broke down on that the artificial intelligence doesn't see your breakdown and notify the human operators? It waits for congestion to mount up, which can take 15, 20 minutes before well, any human person realises there's a problem on a so-called smart motorway. Would you feel safe with you and your family in a car? Well, there are, of course, different sorts of smart motorways, uh, on the specific ones you refer to, the all-lane running ones, yes, you're right, the, the technology clearly needs to be working properly, and Mr Smith highlighted one example where there was a technology outage, and those are exactly, the, the, that's why you need to collect the data over a longer period. So I'm very clear that smart motorways have a lot of advantages, but the public absolutely has to be confident in using them. Um, e even in scenarios which are relatively infrequent, we have to take people with us. And I think that's one of the incredibly valuable things the committee did in the work it took, in the work it did, and the evidence it took, was to challenge government on that. And I think government responded, and, and I think my predecessors made sensible uh, commitments on that, and those are commitments that I maintain. Thank you. Your comments are noted. Ruth, you're next. Uh, thank you, Chair. On, by going back to electric vehicles, uh, the government's committed to deliver at least 300,000 charge points by 2030. If there's going to be no transport legislation in this parliamentary session, yeah, is that deliverable? Um, uh, and uh, if not, what Your can be delivered? So, uh, on the charge points, I don't think that's something that's going to be primarily delivered by legislation. Uh, there are two, two points, I would say. A lot of the charge points are obviously going to be delivered by private investment um, in businesses investing in those, in, in all sorts of things, and we're seeing a lot of that already. There are clearly areas where the taxpayer and my department is going to have to intervene. One of those is to make sure we have a proper network of charge points at motorway service areas and on the strategic road network. The other area is to work with local authorities on making sure we see charging options for people where they don't have the, the on-street stuff. No, I don't believe it does. Uh, it's going to be a combination of private investment um, and investment from the taxpayer in the areas where you need that extra support to make sure we deliver the charging network. So that target is deliverable? You can work that uh, I, I believe the targets that we've set out are deliverable and we're working at uh, pace to make sure we can deliver them. Thank you. Okay. Gavin. Uh, thanks so much. Chair, with regard to um, zero emission buses, 
Um, it's been, it has been a bit of a thorny issue for, for the government since the previous 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 Prime Minister made the, his uh, 4,000 bus pledge. Well, I suppose I'll start with that. In your eyes, is the 4,000 bus pledge a pledge for um, for England, as he's responsible for, or are you responsible for now, or was that for the whole of the UK? I think that was a number for the whole of the UK, and I think, if I remember correctly, I think we're, we're, we're up to about 3,276, if I remember correctly. But it was a, it was a UK commitment, I think, the 4,000. When you say 3,000, I, I you're talking about money, monies that have been committed to um, local or regional authorities in England, because at the moment, according to the written answer I received just a couple of weeks ago, um, of the 4,000, 87 are on the road in England, Another 425 are, are in order. Um, that's less than 2.5%. Scotland has actually got 548, so more, 10% the size, but more than, than England have in terms of actually being ordered. Um, what do you make of that progress? Well, in, ter in terms of actual ordering and procuring? Well, in terms of, in terms of progress, I, I mean, I welcome, I, I don't think there's particularly a competition here between the different parts of the United Kingdom. from our. Competition is fine, and I think, but I think in terms of delivering the United Kingdom's net zero commitments, I mean, frankly, the, the more zero emission buses we have delivered across the UK, the fine. And I personally, I'm very comfortable with, with different parts of the country um, delivering them. I'm, I'm just looking at the, um, um, the, the statistics. Yeah, 3,276 is the number that I've got. Um, uh, and we're we're continuing to deliver them. Whether we quite get to four thousand, we, we'll see. But that was a that was a that was a, a UK number. Did you perhaps write to the committee to, to set out because you've got a different figure than, than my written answer? Could you perhaps say what has been what's been ordered? What is uh, what's on the road? What's been ordered? And obviously, what monies have been um, yes, have I given think to regional authorities. But also, um, can you confirm if any monies? Last question before I hand back to chair. That, if any money has been handed back um, from regional or local authorities in England who are struggling to get operators to um, to run said buses? Yeah, I, I think um, given it's a it's a fair bit of detail you want, I'm very happy to write to the committee to set out yeah. those particular aspects of it. Yeah, all all of those things that you said. Mr. Thank you that, Secretary of State. This so is a quick question for you. Thank you, um, Secretary of State. We have in this country. Uh, regulated peak and off-peak walk-up fares that anyone should be able to buy uh, to get on any train within the time frame. Avanti West Coast and its retailers do not sell those walk-up fares when it suits them. Have you or anyone in your department authorised Avanti West Coast to do this and if you haven't, would you commit to a full investigation as to why? that train company is in effect preventing off-peak train ticket sales and selling tickets, only allowing for sale tickets at a higher price than the off-peak regulated fare. Um, I, I'm, I, it's a very detailed question Mr Lode, I'm very happy to, to instruct my officials to investigate and I will write to the committee to let the committee know. Secretary of State, 
Ben Bradshaw has some more questions. Thank you. Um, Secretary of State, you very welcomely uh, mentioned active travel in your introduction yep. in terms of your priorities. Um, can you update us on the signing off of the fourth round of active travel funding? Because there are about 1,500 schemes waiting to go ahead around the country, and local authorities are very keen to get this funding ASAP. Yes, I'm, I'm, well, I was pleased to mention it because I was trying to give the, the sense that I'm, I'm, despite the fact that we spend a lot of time talking about railways, I'm very conscious that I want to try and make sure the department is the Department for Transport, not the Department for Trains, and we reflect the fact, you know, a third of the trips that people make are, are walking uh, and, uh, and another 2% are cycling. So, um, uh, in answer to my question on the autumn statement, I'm looking at the spending of the department across the, the range of, of uh, modes, which will include active travel. When we've concluded that, we'll be in a position then to, um, to deal with the, the fourth round of the active travel Can you funding. Give us some idea when that might be. It's just because the, 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 the previous Secretary of State before the last one <laughs> had already signed it off. Um, and then when, when Anne-Marie Trevelyan came before <coughs> us, she said she had to sign it off. Um, and now we're waiting for you to sign it off. So, uh, you know, if you haven't had your budget cut and you say this is a priority, uh, what, is, what is stopping you signing this off? So, so we've had our budgets confirmed as we had in the spending review, but you'll know that there, there's a very significant level of inflation we're having to deal with and manage across the department as other government departments are and indeed the private sector. So we're having to look at the priorities across the department. When I've concluded that exercise, which we're doing at pace, we'll be in a position to make that announcement, but I'm not in a position to do that today. So weeks? Months? Well, I, I'm conscious that we need to do it early enough that people can then get those funds and to de deliver them. Um, so uh, I, I'm doing that at the earliest possible opportunity. I'm not going to I'm not going to pluck a date out of thin air and then and then disappoint the committee. What I will do is we've been asked to set out a number of specifics and on the legislative program. I will I will see what we can do in terms of whether I can give you a more specific answer and we'll write to the committee and set that out. So when you, when, when your that. parliamentary colleague Kit Malthouse said on the World at One on the 16th of November, in the context of the uh, new fiscal uh, event, uh, that active travel was a nice to have in good times, in implying that this was going to be cut. Uh, that's not your view. No, I think I think allowing uh, putting schemes in place that enable people to uh, walk uh, more safely and easily, and also to use um, uh, to cycle safely. I think they are very important. Um, but we're having to look at those across the whole piece. I'm very clear, and the reason why I mentioned it was I'm very conscious about how people travel. Um, and I want to make sure that the decisions that we're taking to deal with inflation pressures don't unfairly penalise any particular mode of transport. Is it, is it still, uh, is, is Active Travel England's status as a statutory consultee for major planning applications still under threat? This was threatened by Simon Clarke. Um, and I'm not aware that that threat has been withdrawn. Can you clarify for us, because not least Chris Borden will be very interested in your answer. Uh, I, I, I'm not aware of, of what um, Mr Clark set out when he was a member of the government. He's obviously no longer a member of the government. On that specific question, uh, uh, let me, let me uh, find out and I'll let the committee know. Thank you. Well, right. say, that's noted. Over to Graham. Th thanks, Chair. J just, just on the issue, and I, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's, it's fair to expect, to expect you to know this level of detail, but, but perhaps again you could um, give us some information because as part of our inquiries into Maritime 2050 and the logistics supply chain, the port of Dover, Dover told us that they didn't know when they would find out how the new EU entry exit system checks that are due to come into effect in May of, ne of next year, uh, they didn't know how they would work. Uh, I, I wonder if you could um, give some indication as to uh, as to where we stand with that, and and, and if, if if I may as well uh, ask my uh, my other question, uh, also in relation to uh, the maritime sector, that th there have been some criticisms about the seafarers' wages bill. We're, we're all very concerned uh, about the appalling activities of uh, of, of P and O, uh, followed by other unscrupulous employers. But we're, we're, we're concerned about okay. uh, how international agreements uh, are going to uh, be affected and, and if there's a possibility of circumventing the legislation 
by what's being called port hopping, uh, and how can we avoid that? Okay, so on your on your last point on the seafarers' wages bill, which has obviously been uh, introduced into the House of Commons, um, I'm hoping for an imminent announcement about when we're going to get the second reading of, of that bill. Um, on the specific issue, you I mean, the, the bill obviously has a very specific purpose to deal with um, shipping in UK territorial waters. On the specific point you raise, I don't have the answer to that. I will find out and uh, write to the committee and also make sure we have that when we debate second reading of the legislation. Um, uh, on your uh, Paul de Dover question, uh, so one of the um, of the first visit that I did actually, which was to go and visit the Kent Resilience Forum and also the uh, Port of Dover uh, and Eurotunnel to talk about a range of issues, um, but also to talk about um, the European system. So uh, it's fair to say I think that the European Union hasn't published a great deal of information about how this is going to work. My uh, those. The con there were concerns about that were raised um, mm -hmm. by all of the stakeholders. My department is working closely with um, the port, um, with other parts of the UK government, but also working closely with the European uh, Commission uh, and the French government to try and understand how this is going to be implemented and what the requirements are going to be uh, on us, and particularly at the juxtaposed controls, and that work is um, underway. But obviously it's a European Union system and they need to tell us how uh, what the requirements are going to be and we will obviously then work to comply with them and work with the port I to make sure and, and if you've met, met with the Kent Resilience Forum and the port of Dorby you'll understand their concerns mm -hmm. uh, about the logistics supply chain and so on w w when did you have that meeting just out of curiosity was it recently uh, it was it was a couple of weeks ago yeah all right okay thanks Jeff thank you Graham um Secretary State, just before I move on to to Gavin next I'm conscious yep. that you are going to be writing to us with answers and details on various different subjects and I'm conscious that your two permanent secretaries are sitting right next door to you. So as a matter of process, you don't have to write to us just with one letter. Do let us have the information as it becomes available if that's okay, is that alright? You so always, as you know, seek to um, provide the swiftest possible and fullest possible responses to the committee. Very happy to receive a number of different letters from you and your department. So, Gavin. Uh, thanks so much, Chair. Uh, turning to, uh, I suppose, decarbonisation again, um, and looking back to COP26 with the Clyde Bank um, <coughs> declaration um, at COP26. So, in terms of progress, will the UK have a green shipping corridor by 2025? Um, so, we, as you know, we made a um, commitment at COP working with some of our um, global partners about that um, uh, green shipping corridor. There were 24 countries of, um, committed to supporting the establishment of those. Um, and we're, um, we're, we're trying to work and lead that, that work. Um, I think the, uh, I don't know whether Gareth, yeah, do you want to add anything specific on the timing? No, I think the timing, it will take longer than 2025, as you say, because in terms of, but you've got to work through both the actual ships, the port technologies as well, and when, but in terms of progress we saw at COP27, it was pretty impressive the number of countries that are leaning into this now. We've got pot agreements with the US, Norway, and the Netherlands. Um, similarly, the, the department has put in already £34 million into over 80 projects across the UK around the clean maritime demonstrations. This is about getting the port side technology right. But I think we shouldn't underestimate the scale of the challenge to get the green shipping corridors right. Yeah. But that is a big focus for the department, as the Secretary of State has said. And obviously, it's not in your gift or your control eh, because obviously it's international and whatnot. Right. What, what was. What would be your best estimate as to when we could, when you'd hope to have uh, the first green shipping corridor in place? Um, I'm, I'm balancing between being optimistic and not wanting to disappoint you on this one. I think I'll, I'll play back the answer. A number of people made at COP27, so just to give you a sort of sense of where the international community is on this. They were saying sort of the, the back end of this decade. That was where they were thought they would be fully operational. Before that. I would expect to see pilots running, and particularly around, I'm interested in what's going on back to Dover on the short straits and some of the routes. And I think actually, again, outside of this country, the US, uh, Shang, uh, Singapore links are actually very really interesting. But it's going to be second half of this decade will be my expectation where you see real progress. One of the important things we are working on is to build the international coalition on the back of COP, both 26 and 27, at the IMO to have the focus there on zero emissions okay. and building that coalition, just as we have done 
uh, with international aviation admissions. Yeah, and, and bef just before I move on to a aviation, um, so the EU has just voted uh, to bring shipping emissions into its carbon market, including international vo voyages. Um, does the UK plan to do something similar? I come in. Carbon budget six uh, for the UK, uh, which is the tw around 2035 will include, and I think we've announced this previously, international aviation and shipping emissions. Yeah. And even to date, what we do is when we have the carbon budgets, we make an allowance for international emissions, so they are, in effect, um, accounted for in the system. This is not sort of an off-book set of numbers. OK. Uh, moving on to aviation, and I'll, and I'll come back and touch on uh, emissions, but uh, in terms of aviation uh, in general, uh, Secretary of State, are you confident now, given everything that we've gone through, the airlines and airports have the staffing capacity uh, to avoid a repeat of the disruption we've seen this summer, and to, to some degree, obviously, still continue to see, but uh, not not to the same degree. Yeah, I think following what happened this summer, I think we've done a lot of work with um, both airports and airlines about testing and, and challenging them on their resilience, and I think the work that we've done, particularly talking to them about um, the Christmas and winter period, uh, I think we're, we're uh, confident, or, you know, we've, we've tested their plans uh, and I think they've dealt with some of the issues that they had during the summer. Um, the, the big challenge, of course, coming back to some of my previous answers, is of course in, we are expecting, because the unions have suggested that there may well be some industrial action uh, on the, in the aviation sector, both for public employees and those working for airports and airlines and that will clearly have an impact and airports and airlines will have to respond accordingly but in terms of their base processes I think there's been a lot of work done since the summer to try and avoid that disruption that we saw. Yeah and some, a lot of disruption was caused um, in or, or by the, the ground handling sector which of, of course is one of the uh, of the lowest paid parts of the aviation sector and um, there's supposed to be a review of the ground handling market. I know Heathrow themselves are looking, we're reviewing ground handling at the, the, the airport, but the government are looking at ground handling. So where are you with with reviewing? I, I know there's been different teams at the DFT, but uh, we're told they were reviewing it. So are you aware of any progress? That, in there? that yeah. commitment was one was given, you know, before I came into space. So I'll ask. Yeah, the review's the ongoing that. at the moment, and we're looking to have the report <coughs> ready for the Secretary of State in the early New Year. The early New Year. Yeah, early New Year. OK, thanks. In, ter in terms of the recovery itself in the sector, um, as many of us have warned, and obviously as we've seen in with other downturns in aviation, the recovery is always unequal. So you'll see Heathrow come back a lot quicker than, um, than regional airports. And we've seen the same with Glasgow. Glasgow, for instance, is still 70% of 2019 levels. What do you plan to do as a, as a department to try and assist We've seen that with issues at Doncaster, obviously. What are you going to do to assist airports like Glasgow, like Newcastle, um, et cetera, et cetera, to, to recover? Because jobs are an issue um, at these airports. Well, they are. I mean, look, to some extent, we've seen, we've seen significant changes in travel patterns um, post-COVID. And I, I, think we, I think actually my experience looking at the travel sector, we shouldn't just assume that things are going to go back how they were before. I mean, people have now made... Uh, certainly as far as businesses are concerned, people are now able to do things that they weren't previously able to do. They're prepared to do things before. We've seen changes in business travel um, and international travel. So I think the government will do what we can. If, if there are barriers that are in place that we need to look at, we'll look at those. But to some, some extent, some of this work's going to be done by airlines and airports looking at passenger experience, looking at different travel patterns, looking at responding to their services to meet the changing needs of both business and leisure travellers. I don't think, think just assuming things are going to flip back to what they were before, I don't think it's necessarily the right assumption. And that, that's an entirely <coughs> um, fair point. A large part of this piece will be um, to the regional connectivity, which is, which is another issue we've been um, trying to push the government to um, to respond on, but uh, previously we've spoken about P or previous reports from this committee spoke about PSOs uh, and the, perhaps that more PSOs might be required um, to to generate that revival as well as as, as well as uh, provide more connectivity. All the PSOs currently um, the UK government support are to and from London, and that was a change we 
we're advising uh, should make? Is that something you'd be looking to um, to look at in the coming months? I, on the public service obligations, I, I've certainly got on. I've got an open mind about those. I think you have to look at those on a case by case basis. It's about the. The, the, the need, balancing the need against the cost to the taxpayer. So I, I don't have a closed mind about those where we judge that they're um, necessary um, and, and you know, the need and the cost. Uh, there's a sensible balance and I think we're perfectly happy to take those on a case-by-case -case basis. So I wouldn't want to you know, give you a, a, a general answer. It's, it will look at the specific circumstances, but we're certainly open to looking at them. Okay, we've seen uh, reports in the press recently um, there may well be changes coming or changes afoot with regard to liquids and hand luggage, perhaps from 2024. Is this correct? Well, the, obviously we um, continue to keep these things under review. There are a number of pilots going on about looking at new technology and how you deal with that. If there are any changes that are going to take place um, more widely, then obviously we'll make announcements in due course. There will have to be clear communications around those obviously for to make sure passengers know what's going on so if we announce any of those we will do those in a in a proper way announce them properly with clear communications for people um, as I said when, when we've learned the lessons of the pilots that are that are being undertaken and if this is to be a mandated change and given what I said in the previous question might there be support available for some airports that, um, to make this change if it's a government mandate well if there are any changes in requirements that we make, we will we will do those in the usual way. But I think we're leaping ahead of ourselves here. We, when we make announcements, we will do those in the usual way um, and we'll set out what our expectations are and what the responsibilities are of, of the government, but also of the private sector partners. OK, and last, lastly from, from me, <coughs> the issue of, of decarbonisation, which obviously is tougher for aviation than any other sector. Um, but um, the easiest thing we can do and the quickest thing we can do is airspace modernisation. So where are we with it? Are you pleased with current progress? Um, I think this is... Gareth. Um, so, I mean, I think the, one of the issues we've had with airspace modernisation over the last two years, obviously, has been the impact on the finances of the industry. This has been yes. primarily funded by the airports, and obviously we've had to go slower than we might want it to. Um, due to their impact, due to their ability to fund it. We have put in, as a government, um, best part of £10 million to fund some airspace modernisation. And we see this as, this can seem like quite a technical issue, but obviously, as you, you reflect on it, it's about, you might save up to 10 to 15% of aircraft carbon emissions by modernising airspace. I think the free route airspace in Scotland has been an incredible success. We want to sort of build on that on that lesson. Um, we, we've asked the CAA to come forward with an updated airspace modernisation plan, and they're due to do that in the early new year. Yeah, from what I understand, it would perhaps only take a, a government investment of around £20 million to get this. I think the government will do what we can. If, if there are barriers that are in place that we need to look at, we'll look at those. But to some, some extent, some of this work is going to be done by airlines and airports looking at passenger experience, looking at different travel patterns, looking at responding to their services to meet the changing needs of both business and leisure travellers. I don't think, think just assuming things are going to flip back to what they were before, I don't think is necessarily the right assumption. And that, that's an entirely <coughs> um, fair point. A large part of this piece will be um, to the regional connectivity, which is which is another issue we've been um, trying to push the government to um, to respond on. But uh, previously, we've spoken about P or previous reports from this committee spoke about PSOs, uh, and perhaps that more PSOs might be required um, to to generate that revival as well as as, as well as uh, providing more connectivity. All the PSOs currently um, the UK government support are to and from London, and that was a change we were advising uh, should make. Is that something you'd be looking to um, to look at in the coming months? I, on the public service obligations, I, I've certainly got on. I've got an open mind about those. I think you have to look at those on a case by case basis. It's about the 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 need balancing the need against the cost to the taxpayer. So I, I don't have a closed mind about those where we judge that they're um, necessary. Um, and, and you'll, you know, the need and the cost. Uh, there's a sensible balance, and I think we're perfectly happy to take those on a case by case basis. So I wouldn't want to, you know, give you a, a, a general answer. It's, it will look at the specific circumstances, but we're certainly open to looking at them. Okay, we've seen uh, reports in the press recently 
Um, there may well be changes coming or changes afoot with regard to liquids and hand luggage, perhaps from 2024. Is this correct? Well, the, obviously we um, continue to keep these things under review. There are a number of pilots going on about looking at new technology and how you deal with that. If there are any changes that are going to take place um, more widely, then obviously we'll make announcements in due course. There will have to be clear communications around those, obviously, for to make sure passengers know what's going on. So if we announce any of those, we will do those in a, in a proper way, announce them properly with clear communications for people, um, as I said, when, when we've learned the lessons of the pilots that are, that are being undertaken. And if this is to be a mandated change, and given what I said in the previous question, might there be support available for some airports that, um, to make this change, if it's a government mandate? Well, if there are any changes in requirements that we make, we will, we will do those in the usual way. But I think we're leaping ahead of ourselves here. We, when we make announcements, we will do those in the usual way, um, and we'll set out what our expectations are and what the responsibilities are of, of the government, but also of the private sector partners. Okay, and last, lastly from, from me, <coughs> the issue of, of decarbonisation, which obviously is tougher for aviation than any other sector, um, but um, the easiest thing we can do and the quickest thing we can do is airspace modernisation, so where are we with it? Are you pleased with current progress? Um, I think this is Gareth. Um, so, I mean, I think the, one of the issues we've had with airspace modernisation over the last two years, obviously, has been the impact on the finances of the industry. This has been yes. primarily funded by the airports, and obviously, we've had to go slower than we might want it to um, due to their impact, due to their ability to fund it. We have put in as a government um, best part of £10 million to fund some airspace modernisation, and we see this as this can seem like quite a technical issue, but obviously, as you, you reflect on it, about you might save up to 10 to 15 percent of aircraft carbon emissions by modernising airspace. I think the free route airspace in Scotland has been an incredible success, and we want to sort of build on that on that lesson. Um, we, we've asked the CAA to come forward with an updated airspace modernisation plan, and they're due to do that in the early new year. Yeah, from what I understand, it would perhaps only take a, a government investment of around 20 million pounds to get this to perhaps get this done. Um, is that not something you'd consider? Uh, well, certainly once, I, once we get the report from the CAA, we'll absolutely look at what, uh, if there are any financial consequences, we'll absolutely look at them and we'll look at what the, you know, and have to balance those off against the other priorities. But I'm certainly, certainly very keen to look at what the CAA bring forward. Okay, and, and this is the last question. The, the other achievable method or route to decarbonisation that's, that's within reach is sustainable aviation fuels. Um, so the government are obviously fully aware of that. There's a commitment for five plants, I think, are to be under construction by uh, 2025 and a, a SAF mandate um, by, I think, 2030 of 10% is the, uh, from, from memory. Uh, but the current plans would only have, the, the current plans for sites would only produce 5% um, uh, instead of 10%, so there's, there's obviously <coughs> a lot more work to do. Um, would you consider, as this committee has suggested um, previously, um, looking at uh, a pricing support mechanism such as a CFD type model for sustainable aviation fuels? Your, what you've said, um, uh, Mr. Dunes, in terms of the commitments um, are, are correct, and I'll ask Gareth just yeah. to set out on the CFD. Yeah, I'm very idea. conscious the industry is very interested in the idea of having some sort of contract for difference mechanism to support um, the growth of a sustainable aviation fuel. So, as you say, we've got the demand side incentive through the through the mandate, Indeed, yeah. which is really important. Mm -hmm. I think the big question now is, can you also get the industrial benefits? The mandate will ensure we reduce carbon emissions, but can you actually get the industrial benefits? And I think, for me, the strength of the UK chemical industry suggests there's a real compar potential comparative advantage here. We've put in, as a government, £165 million of startup funding for some of the plants. Um, contract for differences, obviously there's an attraction around that, and that was being, I think that's been used on solar and offshore yep. from memory. The risk is if you get this wrong, it's incredibly expensive for the taxpayers, and you've got to get the calibration of that in entirely right. And given the wider pressures on public finances, it's important that, yes, we look at it, and we are looking at it within the department, but also just recognise, actually, the value for money questions for the taxpayer on this. And I accept that the danger is we, we might fall behind the rest of the world if we, if we don't progress uh, with CFD. But anyway, Chair. Well, um, thank you very much, Gareth and the Secretary of State. And before I come to Ruth, I'd just like to congratulate my colleague on getting three final questions in. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ruth, I'm conscious we, we hopefully Secretary of State will we'll maybe overrun until about 10 minutes, so maybe 20 to 12 will finish. Ruth. 
Uh, thank you. Secretary of State, given the differing travel patterns that you've just mentioned and also constrained carbon budgets that are coming in, do you still support the expansion of Heathrow Airport and Bristol Airport? So um, I'm just conscious on, on Heathrow the complexity of the legal position there, and I don't want to um, jump into that. But look, I'm very conscious that we, on the issue about um, Bristol Airport and, and, and Heathrow, Bristol I know there's a, a, a planning um, issue going on at the moment. I'm just very conscious I don't want to, to uh, dive into those and cause any legal difficulties. So I've asked the Permanent Secretary to... Shall I say something on, on Heathrow? Things. I mean, look, Heathrow, the, the, the legal situation is as, is as it was. Um, there was a series of court cases, I'm sorry, I'll forget the year now because of COVID, but it's probably 2019, 2020, that we worked through various challenges. Um, the national airspace planning system is now in place. It's up for Heathrow. This has always been, as I think it was said in the manifesto, a private sector promoted scheme. It's up for Heathrow then to come forward with plans for how they want to do that. Obviously, given the impact on their finances of COVID, that's been on hold, and we've yet to have conversations with Heathrow. Um, where, the, where their position is on this one. More generally, I think we're looking at what the forecast for aviation numbers will be, which is absolutely the heart of the, of the planning statement. And the assessment to date has been continued uncertainty in the aviation market means it's hard to make future forecasts. And we're waiting for the market to settle down before we then come forward with the future forecast. Didn't answer about the carbon budget. You know, what <coughs> so that's the heart of the carbon budget question is basically, because previously the assessment for the planning statement was made when we pre the net zero commitment from the government. So once we understand the nature of future demand, or at least the uncertainty as comes in, will then be the opportunity for the Secretary of State then to review the planning guidance. Thousands of uh, people in this country were deprived of the, their legal right to compensation when their flights were disrupted or cancelled over the last year. When are you going to give the CAA the powers that it needs to ensure that airlines uh, obey the law and the powers that this committee has called for it to be given uh, repeatedly for many years? So um, this is one of the questions. I've had some my, my uh, introductory meetings with the CAA chairman and chief executive um, and their um, ability to intervene in the consumer space is one of the things I'm looking at very closely. So it's one of the things I've, I've discussed with them. Um, I'm not able to give you a, a, a specific <coughs> timetable. It's maybe one of the things I can set out in writing um, for the committee. Lovely. And in principle, do you think it would be wrong to water down uh, the British public's current right to compensation when their domestic or inter-European flights are disrupted? I'm very keen that I want to make sure that we continue to protect consumers and I want to make sure that the regime for consumer protection, you know, continues to deliver, you know, what we think is right. And I want to look at that. I mean, see whether we can improve it, um, maintain it or, or alter it in any way. But I'm very clear that we want to protect consumers and give them confidence. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary of State. Uh, Jack Broson has some questions for you on buses. Thank, thank you, Chair. And obviously, the pandemic's had a massive impact on uh, local bus services and public transport more generally. So, what is your vision for the future of bus? So, uh, I'm glad you've asked that question. I touched on it in my earlier remarks, and I wanted to mention it to make sure that um, uh, you knew it was a, a priority. So, one of the things that came up at my first set of oral questions, lots of questions about buses, particularly the investment that the government's made in uh, bus service improvement plans, um, a, a lot of the money that we've done in the city region deals have, have had a bus component to them as well. And I'm also very conscious the, the challenges that um, bus services have had um, with COVID and the post-COVID period. And I know in my, my own constituency, there are some real um, challenges in delivering um, sustainable bus services, particularly in rural areas. One of the things I'm very pleased that the department's doing, as well as the funding that we're delivering, is some of the uh, pilots that we're doing about how you can deliver bus services in a way that's more um, sustainable. So, for example, in my own um, constituency delivered before I was Secretary of State. There are some pilots on demand responsive transport um, in two parts of, of Gloucestershire and I'm looking forward to seeing the evidence from those. So I'm very supportive of, of buses. I'm very supportive of us looking at how we can grow 
um, bus ridership. Uh, you know, it's still uh, still a significant lower level than it was pre-COVID, and I want to work with local authorities. Um, uh, having those ambitious plans to grow bus ridership in the future and the government will look at what we can do to support them. As you say, there's been a massive struggle to try and get uh, bus ridership back to uh, pre-pandemic levels. So is it still your uh, and the department's view that we want to get bus ridership up above uh, pre-pandemic levels? I mean, wh where it exactly comes to is obviously going to be a decision for, for individuals, but I do think we want to grow bus ridership um, higher than it is at the moment and clearly you know, get it back to the sort of levels we were looking at. So that's why the, I think the bus improvement, um, uh, bus service improvement plans that we've been doing, have, have, we've tried to encourage local authorities to have ambitious plans to grow bus ridership. One of the things I briefly talked about when I talked to Northern Mayors on my visit, we will come back to, we spent a lot of time talking about trains. I had some very good conversations with Andy Street about his plans for for buses in um, the West Midlands. So I'm very keen that we work with local authorities who have ambitious plans on growing bus ridership and also look at different models. One of the advantages of devolution is we can look at um, different ways of, of managing bus services in different areas to try and grow the ridership, um, have a more modern bus fleet um, and make them easier for people. To